Banco World. It is order. It is not any different from what we have heard from Bukose and others. Go on, Mwenje. Not Mwenje. Mwango. Mwango. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. I really wanted to contribute to this issue because the picketing is actually happening in my constituency. And I'm getting calls from all corners asking me what's going on in my constituency. And it is such a shame that we've come to this point that doctors can actually pick it, given that the, the doctor's career is one of the most superior careers or most lucrative for us, mostly the youth. And the issue of interns, the issue of doctors, I happen to have a sit down with the officials of the, the association. And it is clear some members in this house do not understand the issues that the doctors are, are, are talking about. Because they have clear-cut issues, some which come from 2017, when they were promised some salary increment, and up to date, that has not been effected. The issue of revising the salaries of the interns under the CBA system, where they are being forced to adopt the SRC system, which, 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 which cut down their salaries from 2006,000, Kenyan shilling, uh, 2006, 206, Honourable 271,000 shillings. Honorable Mwango, what you are saying yeah. is what is being prosecuted before the committee. And if you had listened to Honorable CTNA, you probably would have... Yeah, I, I really wanted direction. to bring the issues to the fore because I don't think the, the doctors are even in the mood to pick it. It's only that they have not been listened to. And also there's a, the other issue that the majority leader has brought up uh, out so well, saying that there are more than 2,200 doc, intern doctors who, who have graduated and are going to be adopted. As from the records, as from 2018, there were 7,893 doctors in this country. As of now, we have 9,000 and some 600 something. It's only 1,800 doctors who have been adopted and like employed it to, from interns to be doctors. So there are so many doctors who are overqualified who are working as interns in this country. And I agree with him that our interns are being overworked in the county, in the county hospitals, and it is only right that they be remunerated the right way. Paying a doctor 70,000 shillings is not even fair, and these are people who are charged to take care of the health care of our people. And we are saying, the other time they picketed, they were, they were confronted by the police, and even some of them were tear gassed. And we are saying, any police officer who is going to tear gas these doctors, when he, he falls sick, he too should not be treated in these hospitals by these same doctors. Thank you. Last on this, Ruku. Two minutes. Or three minutes like everybody else. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the county governments have very serious uh, functions as far as health sector is concerned. One of the functions, Mr. Speaker, is budgeting, financial management. Also, when it comes to medical supplies, as well as provision of emergency medicine. Mr. Speaker, all the dispensaries, level four hospitals, and level five hospitals across the nation are under the management of the county government. But almost 80% or more than 80% of the county government in the Republic of Kenya, they have failed Kenyans in a serious manner as far as management of health sector in our country is concerned. Mr. Speaker, this house must call upon all, uh, all county government that they have to take this matter of health in the most serious manner. Failure to which we need to institute a constitutional change where we are going to ensure health sector should not be default. Even if it, it, it takes a referendum, Mr. Speaker, Kenyans are suffering and they are suffering under the hands of our county government across the country. It is true, there are few counties which they, are, which they have managed to manage the health sector in the most appropriate way. We have a few of them, four or so counties, but the rest is pathetic. If you go to Kenyatta Hospital, it's level six hospital. Uh, Kenyatta Rif University Referral Hospital is level six hosp uh, hospital. We are now seeing some of these challenges, meaning that the national government is able to take care of the health sector, is able to take care of level six hospitals in the most appropriate way. But we have seen many problems in our level five hospitals, level four hospitals, and dispensaries. It is upon the county government to ensure 
they take their responsibility seriously. A responsibility which they have been mandated by the thank Constitution you. of the Republic of Kenya. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. Thank you. All the honorable members, members on their feet, take your seats. Members on their take your seats. DK, take your seats. Thank you. Honorable members, we'll go back to order number two for a communication that uh, was delayed. Honorable members, I wish to welcome you back to the House after the short recess, which coincided with the observance of the Easter period for Christians and Ramadan for the Muslims. It is my hope that you are well renewed in your spirits and rejuvenated in your minds to resume transaction of the business of the House for the remainder of the first part of this session. During this period, honorable members, this House is expected to consider various priority businesses, including assessing the suitability of persons nominated for appointment to the positions of ambassadors and high commissioners. Ratification of the Kenya-European Union Economic Partnership Agreement, EPAS, consideration of priority bills, as well as the budget-related matters. Instructively, honorable members, it is projected that the National Treasury will submit the budget estimates for the national government for the financial year 2024-25 on or before 30th April 2024. Additionally, honorable members, you will recall that prior to the short recess, the House passed the Division of Revenue Bill 2024 and revert, referred it to the Senate for bicameral consideration. It is therefore expected that the Senate will send the bill back together with the annual count allocation of revenue bill for financial year 2024-25 during this part of the session. From the foregoing, it is evident that the House has a full in-tray. As a result, your dedication and commitment to the business of the House, both in plenary and committees, will be of paramount guidance, significance. Honorable members, with respect to facilitation of members, the Parliamentary Service Commission is expecting, is expediting the completion of the Bunge Tower in order to bridge the deficit in office accommodation for members. Consequently, PSC has established that members' offices in the building will be ready for occupation by the end of this week. Honorable members, you may recall, on 1st November 2022, I directed the clerk to allocate part of the building earmarked for the National Assembly in readiness for occupation at the appropriate time. Further, I prescribe the criteria for allocation, consequent to which the clerk allocated the offices, committee rooms, and auxiliary facilities in that hour. Having said that, honorable members, I also wish to inform the House that Kenya will host the 2024 annual meetings of the African Development Bank, AFDB Group. The annual meetings will be held at the Kenyatta International Conference Center, KICC, from 27th to 31st May 2024, and will bring together high-level delegates, among them being heads of state and governments. In this regard, and in order to accord the delegates appropriate facilitation, the National Treasury has requested Parliament to release 47 offices at KICC to accommodate the dignitaries, with effect from Thursday 11th April 2024. To this end, honorable members, the Parliamentary Service Commission has acceded to the request to temporarily release the offices released by the Commission of the KICC during the African Development Bank annual meetings. Clearly, this will necessitate the relocation of 42 members of this House who are currently accommodated at KICC. In this regard, honorable members, the first occupation of members' offices in the Bunge Tower will be undertaken in accordance with the schedule of allocation prepared by the clerk of the National Assembly. Phase one will involve moving members from KICC to the tower or other alternative accommodation, and this will commence on Thursday, 11th April, 2024. 
For clarity, honorable members, the exercise will proceed as follows. First, all members currently in the Harambe Circle Plaza who are allocated offices in the tower will immediately relocate to their new offices in the Bunge Tower. This is intended to create room to accommodate members relocating from KICC who are unsuccessful in the balloting for offices in the Bunge Tower. And second, members with offices at KICC who are allocated offices in the Bunge Tower are to be relocated to the assigned offices in the Bunge Tower. Phase two of the relocation will entail the following. A relocation of members from Continental House to the Bunge Tower for those who are allocated offices in the new tower. B, relocation of members from list offices to the Bunge Tower from 1st July 2024 for the case of members who are allocated offices in the tower. And C, allocation of appropriate offices in other buildings within Parliament Square to members moving from Continental House or lease premises who are not allocated offices in the Bunge Tower. Honorable members, the measures stated above are for the convenience of all members and in preparation for the official opening of the Bunge Tower by the head of state later this month. I therefore urge you to cooperate with the Office of the Clerk in order to ensure seamless execution of this important exercise. Final honorable members, may I take this opportunity to wish the Muslim community in Parliament and in the entire nation, Aid Mubarak. The House is accordingly guided. Thank you. And members, Musisumbue Clark, if you are located at an office and you are in KICC, you have to move by Thursday, day after tomorrow. Because the Treasury is taking those offices to prepare for the ADB meeting that I've just mentioned. Please cooperate with the Office of the Clerk. And uh, in a very short time to come, Bunge Tower will be opened officially. And we hope to move as many of members from both houses to that tower. Thank you. Order number eight, the National Council for Population and Development Bill, National Assembly Bill number 72 of 2023, first reading. A bill for an act of parliament to provide for the establishment, roles, and functions of the Kenya National Council for Population and Development and for, and for the establishment of the board of the council and for connected purposes. Order number nine, the Public Finance Management Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill number two of 2024, first reading. A bill for an act of parliament to amend the Public Finance Management Act 2012 and for connected purposes. Order number 10, the Technopolis Bill National Assembly Bill Number 6 of 2024, first reading. A bill for an act of parliament to establish the Technopolis Development Authority to provide a framework for the development and management of technopolises and for connected purposes. Order number 11. The Cooperatives Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 7 of 2024, first reading. A bill for an Act of Parliament to establish the Office of the Commissioner for Cooperative Development at the national level of government and the Office of the County Director for Cooperatives in each county government to provide for promotion, registration, and regulation of cooperatives to provide for intergovernmental -gov cooperative relations and for connected purposes. All the order, honorable members, order, order, Musa Sirma. What you are doing is out of order. Honorable members, take your seats. I know it's the first day after a short recess, but the levels of excitement far outweigh the two weeks you have been away. 
Uh, Naizula, what's your point of order? Give her the mic. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Unless I did not hear clearly, but having listened to Honorable Sitene of Tarbo and the weighty matter that she presented on the petition, Mr. Speaker, she was requesting for more time for them to complete the petition. And I thought that it would be important for you to give direction on how long, how much more time they can have looking at the gravity of the matter, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Naisula. I should have given you time at that time, but there was a lot of loud consultations. Honorable CTNA, are you in the house? The way I understood it, Naisula, is uh, Dr. Bukosi said, uh, I have permitted them actually to meet tomorrow, which has turned out to be a public holiday. So for them to invite outsiders to parliament, our standing orders require two weeks, so seven days. So they have requested that they'll expedite the invitations to meet on Tuesday. As to the Honorable CTNA, I hope that by the close of next week or a week after, we'll mention the matter. They will have concluded what they are doing to bring a report to the House. I know that that committee has uh, a lot of backlog, but I was briefed today that uh, they have improved and increased their speed in processing petitions in a manner that is unprecedented, and they are churning out reports that will be coming to the House. So members who have presented petitions on behalf of other Kenyans, when those reports come, you know we are not obligated to debate them. You need to go through them. And if there are any issues you wish to raise, you bring it to the attention of the speaker, and I'll accommodate you. Thank you. Before we call the next order, honorable members, allow me to acknowledge the following uh, in the public gallery. EAPC church pastors from Runyenges in Embu and Koiwa Central Secondary School from Konoin in Bomet have been requested by the Honorable Karemba to welcome his uh, constituents from Embu. I give you two minutes, Honorable Karemba. Thank you, Honorable Kenya. And I am very delighted, Honorable Speaker, to have uh, uh, these members of the clergy here, led by one Right Reverend Bishop John Jeru who was once my Sunday school teacher, but has, uh, has now become the, the, the general overseer of the church. Honorable Speaker, they have, they have come at a time when we are having a doctor's uh, strike, doctor's strike, and their entry to parliament has been obstructed. So it has taken them a little longer to get uh, to this place. Uh, but uh, I am sure, Honorable Speaker, that uh, by them getting in here, things will never be the same again. I know them. I know how much they pray. And they're going to pray over this issue. And uh, I am sure soon and very soon we are going to uh, have a solution to the ongoing doctor strike. So, Honorable Speaker, uh, I wish to thank you for the opportunity to welcome them. Uh, they have been uh, very important in the, in the service to humanity. And we have partnered, partnered with them long enough to offer services to our people, and uh, we meet every so often to ensure that our people are properly taken care of, both uh, spiritually and also politically. So thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Karemba. Next order. Order number 12, the National Disaster Risk Management Bill National Assembly Bill Number 24 of 2023, second reading, resumption of debate. Honorable members, is Honorable Andrew Okwame in the house? My record shows that he had nine minutes to go. Is he in the house? Position forfeited. 
Now, honorable members, I see the screen is full. We don't have a wound at the top. Is it to debate this bill, or you are there for something else? Give Oundo the mic. Mr. Honorable Speaker, I also welcome you back from the short recess. Yes. I already made a, a, my contribution on this bill, yes. so I leave it for somebody else to continue. I already made my contribution. Honorable, just hold Oundo. Honorable members, if you are on the screen, it's, it's very good. You have now been wiped out. So if you want to speak to this bill, now you can log in. I want to proceed. I had already made a contribution to this bill. That's why I'm logging out, Chair. You had Speaker. already made a contribution? Yes, yes. Why were you top on the list on my screen? Well, probably they just like me, Honorable Speaker. It's not my mistake. Honorable Geoffrey Ruku. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I, I rise to, to contribute or to support this uh, bill as far as the uh, National Disaster Risk Management Bill is concerned. Mr. Speaker, I realize this country has witnessed a number of disasters, and one of the uh, problems which we have always faced when we have a national disaster is mobilization of resources uh, to mitigate uh, deadly outcomes. Um, and mostly we have disasters such as drought. At the moment we are witness, witnessing Fra uh, France uh, as well as uh, uh, terror attacks. So this bill will seek to ensure we extend mobilization of resources so that in case of uh, drought, many families and rights are not lost. In case of France, we ensure there is immediate mobilization of resources to take care of France. Also, we have seen terror attacks in this country, but we are fortunate enough at the moment we have staying for quite a number of years without any terror attack. And we thank our security agencies for the good work they are doing. But in case of a terror attack, Mr. Speaker, we need a proper law in place to ensure there is quick mobilization of resources to ensure it is well taken care of. Also, Mr. Speaker, the formalization of ensuring this proper public-private partnership in case of a disaster. When we have a disaster, Mr. Speaker, there are always consequences which may need in future to be mitigated so that the impact of that disaster may not stay with us for ages. And therefore, a situation where we may want to have public-private partnership, this bill is bringing in such a kind of a model which can be adopted to ensure there is a proper um, formulation of a public-private uh, partnership. Also, Mr. Speaker, we know that disasters, there is loss of life, there is loss of property. This bill will ensure that it will, uh, there will be less or there will be reduction of loss of life and property occasioned by disasters such as France, such as drought, and such as a terror attack. Mr. Speaker, I think this is a, a good bill which is looking into the posterity of our nation, and that's why I do support. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Beatrice Elachi. Honorable Undo, you said you had already spoken on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You've logged in again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I also rise to support this bill. 
And Mr. Speaker, just to speak on the perennial disasters that we normally find ourselves, especially in Nairobi, and one of them being indeed now the floods that we have. And when you look at the memorandum of objects, Mr. Speaker, the bill is establish, establishes the Intergovernmental Council on Disaster Risk Management and the National Risk Management Authority to ensure that there is coordination of disaster risk management issues at the national and county level. But it also says in one of the articles, Mr. Speaker, that the president may, and I'm wondering, may when there is a disaster, why would the president may? The president shall, should be the word that we need to use. Because when we are talking of disasters, Mr. Speaker, that is the time now where we need the national government to come in. Because when you look at how county governments are structured today, Mr. Speaker, and any disaster that happens, even just the recent one, that we had a flash rain on a Sunday night and the whole thing goes into disaster. Mr. Speaker, you find that the counties will take more than 10 hours to come and even just support a very simple thing that needs to be done. And so if you tell me in disaster's time that now the national government should not come in, then that one we will have serious challenges in this country. We have seen disasters in Mandera. We've seen what has happened there, either in drought or in floods, or even just buildings coming down. So one of the things we should be asking ourselves, as much as the bill looks at the shared functions, and it says this is a shared function between the national and county government, I think, Mr. Speaker, we must ensure this is a more function of the national government. What the county can only come and do to support is to ensure they avail not resources of money, but manpower. But resources must come from the national government just the way in the U.S. when they have a national disaster. It is the federal government that comes in to stand with the people. Mr. Speaker, the other thing, Kenyans don't know when they are in disaster about county or national. So why can't we just tie up the bill and just say, when there is serious disaster, it is the national government to take responsibility? And Mr. Speaker, when you look at part one of uh, the bill, which contains the preliminary provisions, but then when you move down, you ask yourself, this uh, council of intergovernmental, is it a council now where you bring us, again, the national team which is already there, plus the county, or we get people who are expertise, who understand how to deal with disaster. The other day I looked at Thailand, Mr. Speaker, and they had an earthquake. And everyone in the world was shocked in how they managed that disaster. And the next morning when people were waking up, they had cleared cleared even the bodies. They were now just removing those who were stuck and everything. So even as we speak at this, we must know as a country, we are never ready on any disaster. We are never ready. We now find ourselves in disaster is when we wake up and realize disaster is happening. So for me, the first thing, we, and we must do the simple things that create now disaster. Like now, we know why we have floods in Nairobi. It's because the drainages are blocked. And so who are those responsible in ensuring, first of all, we have drainage, second, they are unblocked? The county has to just look at it, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, this is a bill that comes in at the right time, yes? But it's a bill we need to really ask ourselves, because I can see many of the functions sought to go back to the counties, and yet we are saying uh, the counties do not have capacity for now. So, Mr. Speaker, even as we support this bill, there is need for us to tidy up a lot of the things that have been put. And uh, one of the things we are saying, uh, for example, the office of a member of a county committee shall become, uh, that was when they are becoming vacant. But this county committee that we are putting, Mr. Speaker, if now we already have, how do we ensure, first of all, they are empowered? And so we must ask ourselves where the national government is, because I can see 
the county committee, the county committee, and when you hear what the national government is coming to do, then you realize this is a function you have ensured, skewed it more to the counties, yet we know very well they don't have money to deal with these disasters. The thing that counties deal with mostly, Mr. Speaker, in their disaster is when they are looking for unga to buy for the people who are hungry, sometimes mabati. But these tough, tough things that come and God forbid, the way we are doing all these things in, the, in Nairobi, the housing and all that, if anything happens, and with this rain, the way it is raining every day, Mr. Speaker, we have to be very serious when we are saying we want this function to be with the county. So for me, Mr. Speaker, I propose that when we come to really the committee of the whole, we need to look at how do we tighten up and ensure the national government takes control of more of these disasters than the county governments. With those few remarks, Mr. Speaker, I beg to support. Thank you, Member for Dagoretti. Timothy Toroitich, Mayor Maraquet West. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker, for giving me an opportunity to contribute on this uh, very important motion on national disaster, I mean, bill on national disaster risk management. Honorable Speaker, under the Constitution, disaster management is a function of the county government. But, Honorable Speaker, if you read the fourth schedule, it seems, it suggests that this function is, share, is a shared function. And Honorable Speaker, it is prudent that we set up a proper legal and institutional framework to manage disaster in this country. Honorable Speaker, whenever there is disaster in this country, what normally happens is that the county government allocates money. I mean, the national government allocates money to the county governments, but this money has never been utilized to meet its intended purpose. Honorable Speaker, the formation of an in, inter, uh, that is uh, the formation of what you call intergovernmental council to be able to oversee the funds that have been channeled to the county government is, for me, a fundamental way of, be, of, of solving issues of disaster in this country. Honorable Speaker, disaster cannot be said to belong to either the national government or the county government. When a disaster strikes, the people who are affected are not, do not belong to the national government, do not belong to the county government. Honorable Speaker, these are the residents of this country. They are those who occupy Kenya, and therefore, the national government and the county government must be able to sit down and be able to resolve the challenges faced by people without selecting whether it is a national government and or a county government. Honorable Speaker, what is happening now is that this matter, the issues of disasters in this country, as we speak, is purely the purpose of a county government. Honorable Speaker, in my opinion, when it comes to the review of our constitution, which must ultimately come in the near future, this function should and must be transferred fully to the national government. Honorable Speaker, in this country, under Article 91 of the Constitution, the county governments are charged with making laws in certain devolved functions. Honorable Speaker, there is a problem because of what you call cross-border legislations. Honorable Speaker, since this matter is devolved, you find that already 47 county governments have made various legislations which sometimes are conflicting. Honorable Speaker, we must have a cross-border legislation. Honorable Speaker, the only way we, which we can have a cross-county cross legislation is establishing a national legal framework, which we are doing today, so that we provide a uniform legislation that guides the 47 county governments. Honorable Speaker, we have a challenge in this country in terms of conflict of legislations that are being channeled by county assemblies for the reason that certain functions are devolved. So, Honorable Speaker, we must think as a country that if a function is shared between the national government and the, and the, national, between the national government and the county government, then there must be a uniform set of law that provides very clearly that this function is shared and for that reason we do not have what you call conflict of legislations which may bring issues. Honorable Speaker, we have challenges. For example, I, I had a chance to work in the county government 
in the county assembly of Elgia Marakwet. Honorable Speaker, I am, the, I am one of the drafters of the Elgeyo Marakwet County Assembly legislation on disaster management. But, Honorable Speaker, as I was drafting that legislation, I realized that there was a problem because where I was as the legal counsel acting for the County Assembly of Elgeyo Marakwet at that time, I realized that my neighboring county, which is was in Gishu County Government, had also had a similar legislation on the issue of disaster. Honorable Speaker, for example, if at that period of time, this other county do not have enough facilities, then it means the neighboring county must be able to assist another county in terms of facilities. Honorable Speaker, if we do not have a uniform legislation, if we do not have a, an authority which governs both the national government and the county government, if we do not have a council which is intergovernmental, then you may realize that another county may suffer at the expense of another county. So, Honorable Speaker, I rise, I support this legislation and pray that this authority that has been established will serve its intended purpose as was envisaged, as was provided for in the Constitution. Final Honorable Speaker, I have read the functions of this particular intergovernmental council which has been provided under Clause 6 of the bill. Honorable Speaker, one of the functions of this intergovernmental council is one is to advise and make recommendations to the cabinet and the summit. Honorable Speaker, whenever there is an emergency, whenever there is a disaster, the cabinet must be notified and shall be notified by this council so that county governments, whenever there is a disaster in a particular county, the county governments cannot make decisions without involving the national government. For me, Honorable Speaker, that is a plus. Honorable Speaker, number two, also, this intergovernmental council shall be able to provide policy direction and approve plans on all activities related to disaster risk management. Honorable Speaker, as I have said, the disaster cannot belong to a particular county. When a disaster strikes, it affects our citizens. It affects Kenyans. Honorable Speaker, therefore, there must be a specific policy direction that is approved by that particular council. Honorable Speaker, if, if you look at it further, it is also to receive and consider and make decisions based on reports and recommendations. Honorable Speaker, this House makes certain policy recommendations that there must be a council that approves that authority. Honorable Speaker, I have read the bill. That council must be one that serves both levels of government and therefore is entitled to make uh, that, that particular. Honorable Speaker, finally, that authority, that council also reports to the cabinet. Honorable Speaker, the cabinet, in terms of policy direct directives, all policies that affect government must be approved at the cabinet level. So, Honorable Speaker, that particular council ensures that decisions relating or policies relating to disaster management are approved by the cabinet. Honorable Speaker, as I finish, I commend the direction we have taken as a country. I commend the direction we have taken as a house. That, Honorable Speaker, when a matter is shared between the national government and the county government, then as a house, we must sit down, we scrutinize the fourth schedule so that we do not have what you call conflict of legislations um, emanating from our county assemblies. We must have a uniform set of laws that governs the 47, count, uh, the 47 counties in this country to avoid conflict of legislation and conflict of re representation in various cadres. Honorable Speaker, I rise, I support this bill. When it comes to the committee of the whole house, I will make, I will propose the necessary amendments so that we can be able to strengthen the provisions of this particular proposed legislation. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you, Timothy. Honorable members, order. Before I give the next speaker, allow me to recognize in the speakers and public gallery students, and I believe with teachers, from Ogande Girls High School, Homer Bay Town in Homer Bay. 
I've been requested by the Honorable T.J. Kajuang to welcome the students. I'll give you one minute, T.J., because it's in the middle of debate. Give Kajuang. Uh, 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 Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you uh, for asking me to welcome a huge delegation from Ogande Girls Secondary School, 300 girls visiting us. We have had delegations uh, of uh, students visiting us, but we have not had 300 students coming in one, uh, in one uh, delegation. These are uh, fourth formers, history students, as you see them, brilliant and bright. And on behalf of uh, their member, Honorable uh, George Opondo Kaloma, I want to welcome them to this house uh, that uh, they have an opportunity to see the speaker himself. And the house has assembled. This should give them inspiration that in a few months coming, these young people should be doctors that you were talking about this morning these young people should, very few should be lawyers, and none should be a politician, but most of them should be engineers. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for, for that opportunity. Thank you. Honorable Gideon Muliungi, Mwingi Central. Gideon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me this opportunity to contribute to this very important uh, bill, the National Disaster Risk, Risk Management Bill. Mr. Speaker, there has been a problem in Kenya. Whenever we are faced with a disaster, the coordination of uh, responses is disjointed. And in most cases, we are mainly reactive and uh, not reactive. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, I support that uh, we establish the Intergovernmental Council on Disaster Management and the National Disaster Risk Management Authority at both the levels of government, both at the national government and the county government. Because in most cases, the county government does not know what the national government is doing, and also the national government does not know what the county government is doing. Mr. Speaker, uh, there has been in the past many disasters witnessed in Kenya. And some of them, they just happen and nothing happens in terms of uh, responses. If I give an example, Mr. Speaker, when we were attacked by terror, terrorists at the Westgate Mall. Mr. Speaker, there was a lot of use and cries all over. And the coordination was not well done. And therefore, if there is a standing authority, a standing committee that is prepared and on a day-to-day -day basis deals with the disaster and nothing else, in my view, I think... Um, the country will be moving in the right direction. Mr. Speaker, as we gather here in this house, the gate of parliament is closed by mendics because of a problem that has arisen. And Mr. Speaker, I consider this one as a disaster because many Kenyans are dying in hospitals because of lack of doctors. And an authority like this one, which prepares for such kind of cases, will come in handy to deal with cases of disasters. Because what is happening in our hospitals now is a disaster. Mr. Speaker, the other day we witnessed um, Eonino rains all over Kenya. And many roads were destroyed. And there has been no intervention at all in terms of uh, repairing most of those roads. Some of them are trunk roads. Some of them are feeder roads. And in a situation whereby we have this kind of an authority and an apex coordination committee, it will deal with disconnected roads 
all over the country whenever those kind of emergencies happens. Mr. Speaker, also we are witnessing a lot of increased level of road carnage. And Mr. Speaker, um, a situation like this one can be addressed by an authority like this one, which deals with the emergencies of uh, road carnage. Mr. Speaker, we have also in the past witnessed increased high cost of living. Farming in uh, the northern frontiers and also in the counties in Ukambani, where relief food is being distributed all over the counties. And Mr. Speaker, an authority like this one will prepare itself to deal with uh, such kind of emergencies. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, where I come from, I want to support this on behalf of the people of Mwingi that we establish this um, uh, Disaster Risk Management Committee and uh, authority so that it can deal with the uh, disasters in Kenya. With those few remarks, Mr. Speaker, I support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert Basil. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to support this bill on many, very many reasons. We need to acknowledge that disasters such as floods, famine, fire, and diseases disrupt functioning of community, more so increase vulnerabilities. Mr. Speaker, one of the key reasons why I support this bill is because disasters strike without any particular warning and it's important to cushion our people from loss of life and properties. Number two, Mr. Speaker, we need to equip our people with the right skills and training. And having a fund to support training and capacity building is very essential and is one of the reasons why I support this particular bill. Number three, Mr. Speaker, we need to ensure our people recover better. We call it building back better. And this can only be facilitated when we have a fund that can be able to support such an initiative. Number four, Mr. Speaker, a proper response to disaster, re, disaster issues or the destruction caused by disasters is important. And this particular fund will support response to disasters, and that is why Mr. Speaker, I add my voice to support the bill. Number five, Mr. Speaker, we need to understand that although disaster management is a shared responsibility between the county government and the national government, the issues to do with the capacity of county government to manage disaster, more so the fund for this disaster response, is questionable. And that's why, as a house, when we are going to be making an amendment to this bill, we need to agree where to seat this particular fund so that at least we best or, or we, we place the fund to a, an authority or a government with the right capacity, and no doubt that is the national government that will be able to manage the, the fund and make sure it is properly utilized. So, Mr. Speaker, now I can see Madam Speaker. I do say that with the... With the, with, with the due consideration, and have you looked to the, to, the, to, the, to the important function this particular fund is going to play, I fully support the bill, and uh, I do applause the, the move of the bill, who is the leader of majority, Honorable Uchungwa, for bringing the bill, which is very timely, considering now we are times of rains, and we are likely to witness floods, which are going to cause destructions. And more so when you hear floods, we can't talk, or well, we can't exonerate waterborne diseases like cholera, which are likely to emerge because of the current rains and floods. So having a fund is important, and I support. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Member for Teso South, Honorable Mary Emase. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute to this bill this is a very good bill from the onset I support because 
It is bringing together, creating a link between national government and county government on issues management of disaster. Because what we have seen in the past, Madam Speaker, flooding in many areas of this country, accidents, name them, you find that there is no coordination and, 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 and response is delayed. And sometimes these monies, when they are sent to the county governments, to, because it's a devolved function, to deal with the issues of disaster, sometimes the money, uh, there are issues of accountability in respect to the management of these resources. So when I see that there will be a disaster committee in every county that onboards all important stakeholders, like the Red Cross, St. John's Ambulance, county commissioner, county commander, the governor, and all uh, stakeholders within the county. And this uh, particular uh, council will just be focusing and dedicating and putting all its efforts towards management of disaster. Then, Honorable Speaker, I foresee uh, a, a situation where we're going to have proper management and quick responses to addressing uh, or mitigating issues around the disaster. So, Madam Speaker, I support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, the Honorable Member, uh, Honorable Irene Mayaka. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. And Honorable Speaker, I also stand to support this particular bill because, Honorable Speaker, I actually believe that this bill uh, has come to the House at the right time, and I think it's very progressive because in the past, we've always been dealing with disaster issues in this country with a knee-jerk reaction. We wait until a disaster occurs, and then we quickly look for a solution that only uh, solves the problem at that particular time, or in some instances, doesn't even solve it. And Honorable Speaker, when I say this, I'm just thinking back, uh, reflecting back to the last two weeks, when we had a situation where the expressway was flooded, and we could not be able to access it. And yet, if we had such an authority in, in, uh, within the county of Nairobi, they would have been able to actually analyze situations based on historical data that we have to be able to know whether or not uh, something is going to happen or preempt issues that are going to happen. Honorable Speaker, especially during a time when we have so many climate change issues, and the climate change issues that we have range from different counties and different counties experience different types of issues. Like for example, Honorable Speaker, when I speak about my county in Nyamira, the disasters and risk management issues that are in that county will probably be very different from another county like Mombasa. And so having these uh, particular authorities customized to the specific counties is very progressive. And Honorable Speaker, I want to also um, believe that once this is established, that uh, the people who will be part of these uh, particular authorities will be able to go back into the history of the different types of disasters, the different types of risk associated with the areas that they, are, uh, they, they, they govern, so that they can be able to actually customize them according to their areas. Honorable Speaker, of particular interest for me is part three of the bill, where it talks about classification of disaster plans and electronic information system. And why I like this, Honorable Speaker, is because with time and the fact that we are very much in the technological space, we need to actually customize our bills to be able to bring in an aspect of IT. Because, Honorable Speaker, without data, you will not be able to even um, have a clear view of what you're dealing with. You need data, Honorable Speaker, for you to be able to even make a, com a, a comprehensive report and for you to be able to even speak to other people who you want to be able to assist as well. Honorable Speaker, I also like the part that in part two of, um, of part three of uh, the electronic information system, that it also mentions that this data will be accessible to the public. And not only that, but that also they will ensure that Data Protection Act of 2019 is taken into consideration. Because, Honorable Speaker, again, for as much as we want our people to be able to access data, we must also safeguard them. 
But in, uh, having said that, we cannot safeguard ourselves too much to an extent that we are stifling innovation. And Honorable Speaker, I'd just like to throw a spanner in the works in terms of this particular bill. Because I've gone through it, but I've not seen any aspect of AI. And what I'm talking about, Honorable Speaker, is, for example, the current issue we have with the, our fertilizer. If we had a drone-based system in this country that would have been able to quickly analyze the fertilizer that we're receiving, analyze the soils, um, figure out what the pH of the soils is, and be able to determine note-to-note um, uh, -note in terms of what you want to actually put in different soils, then we'd not be having this kind of problems. And so I just want to urge all of us, when you are coming up with these very progressive bills, like this particular one, we should also always include an aspect of AI. Because artificial information, Honorable Speaker, is very important. We cannot ignore it anymore in this country. And it also just helps us to make our work easy. And so I just want to encourage um, the person who sponsored this bill. At the time of amendments, when the amendments come, and we bring in amendments that are relating to IT and information system, that they do allow us to bring in some of these progressive ideas. Honorable Speaker, with those very short remarks, I do support. The Honorable Member for Kwanzaa, Honorable Ferdinand Wanyonyi. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I raise to support this bill. I think it's very important that uh, we establish uh, units or departments in uh, both that can be, be able to correspond with whatever happens in the county. Um, currently, Madam Speaker, you will see, and uh, from the experience, at times you find something has happened in the, in the county, and you know you find there's no spark up, either from the government or from the, um, the county government. So if we have uh, set up uh, a coordination, a, a departmental unit, that will be able to deal with whatever disaster that we'll be able to have. You never know, one of which is, uh, for example, we have these uh, floods. The floods sometimes affect areas. And then, of course, you are a member of parliament. You don't know whether it should come to you, and you don't have that kind of money for emergency. When you involve the county government, they equally say they don't have that kind of thing. But if you have that disaster uh, management, uh, unit will be able to assist. We have cases where, for example, a bridge is broken because of the flooding or whatever disaster it is. Madam Speaker, you find yourself in a very awkward situation. As a leader, you don't know who to refer to. Had a case, for example, of a flood covering almost four, no, there were two, there were two wards. I didn't even know what to do because when I called my counterpart, I called my governor, and he said, but where do I get the money from? I didn't even have that as well. So, Madam Speaker, it's, uh, this is quite appropriate, and I think what we should do is to have this uh, risk management bill passed as soon as possible so that you can be able to allocate whatever funds are going to be there and give the guidelines as to how to use that fund. Because, of course, if you just put it there, um, it's so that you have, uh, if there's any emergency, you have got the central government through the member of parliament or women rep involved, plus, of course, the county government, so that it can be a secondary to the expenditure of such uh, funds. So risk management, uh, Madam Speaker, um, risk management uh, bill, as I see it here, is something very, very important, and I think I request this House to pass it yesterday, not today, not tomorrow, so that can be able to move faster and be able to deal with some of the disasters that actually occur uh, without uh, uh, giving a warning. Um, so I, I, I want to take this opportunity to uh, support this, and I hope the House uh, can have this, because we are members who are affected all the time even some of the small little things like a bridge or even a road. 
Uh, so you, you find that they are actually coming to you. And uh, if you have this kind of funds, you can be able to see how much each side can spend. So I support this bill. Thank you. The Honorable Member for Sigor, Honorable Locha Kapong. Oh, yes, yes, I'm told you're the mover, but you have your card, so you can actually, yeah, leave, pull it out. Okay, thank you. The Honorable Edith Nyanze, member for Kitui West. Um, speaker, I would like to contribute to the next one. Thank you. The Honorable member for Kisumu, Honorable Shakil Shabir. Uh, madam, um, I'm actually beaten. I was just trying to log in, so I, I be excused, please. I, I don't have a contribution at this moment. The Honorable Member for Vihiga, Honorable Beatrice Adagala. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, for giving me this opportunity to also contribute on this bill. Uh, I on. Uh, on, on the onset, Madam Speaker, I'll support this bill before I even talk, because it has come at the right time, whereby we have several emergencies that have take place in the country, and especially our counties. You'll find, like my county, there is a disaster, a school has burnt down, or anything like uh, in the gold mines, they rush to, they rush to the county woman MP looking for money to sponsor those kind of disasters. And Madam Speaker, in our, in our kit, as you all know, the women rep have no money to, to, do, to go towards such uh, disasters. Like there was a case in one of the wards whereby the rains uh, caused havoc. So many houses were blown away. And people look at you as the county woman rep to to go and give money for those kind of calamities, which we cannot afford to, to bear, Madam Speaker. So I think if this can be put into consideration, and also the county government plus the national government, we put our efforts together so that when we, we have, an, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, have a, a kit for this kind of disaster when it happens, like right now you are seeing floods all over, uh, houses are being swept and now we have it very rough as members of parliament and especially the women reps because everybody when houses are swept everybody tells the people the women rep can do that and uh, the, the, the county governments the governors keep quiet so it means that we are not prepared as a county or a country for this kind of disaster so this bill May cure what is needed, Madam Speaker. And I'm very sure I will support this with all my strength. We want to see uh, something put into place and which can be managed very well. <clears throat> Not like that scenario of where we were hearing of uh, uh, money being put aside for El, El Nino. You hear blame games here and there. Measures should be put in place whereby this fund once it's been set aside, can, can be handled by a, a certain committee which can uh, really assist, Madam Speaker. And if this is done, it will really assist us. Schools that get burnt all the time, floods that come all the time, the wind that blow away houses, because I'm very much affected, because when this happened, they always send to the women rep to get in charge to, to take care of such uh, uh, incidents, and we don't have funds for that. So, Madam Speaker, I really support this bill, and uh, I support it. Thank you. The Honorable Naomi Wako, member for Marsabit. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for allowing me to add my voice to this very important uh, bill. Um, and uh, Madam Speaker, anything 
to manage disaster that comes to us from time to time is something that we should all give support and establishing um, a council of disaster risk management is the most important thing that we can do today because from time to time you see that we land into problems especially like now when it is raining it is in some areas it is already uh, people are already displaced because of the floods and especially in the areas that some of us come from even the wind comes and blows off the the schools um, um, the roofs and then even the houses and most of the time we land into problems that we are not even prepared for so if at the county level and at the national level we have disaster national disaster risk management bill then that can hide can, can guide and can help many are the times that we even lose people uh, because of the disasters um, in different ways the fire you know sometimes some people can experience fire and they lose their homes they lose their properties and they lose even their lives so the best thing that can help us is to have this bill in place so that uh, we can be able to manage that. I like, uh, I support the bill because of the uh, composition of the board members, the qualified people who are to be there, so that in any uh, board, then we have qualified people, we have people who are well experienced so that they can hold the offices and have the right thing in place. The bill has taken care of different things, uh, vacation of offices, uh, it has also taken care of functions of the board, it has taken care of the powers of the board, and also uh, identified or, or talks of the committees of the board and uh, delegation of the board. All that ensures um, good uh, care of, of the entire bill, and also what it does at the, at the ground level. So, Madam Speaker, I, just, I am just supporting the bill and pray that uh, many people will support and that this bill will be uh, soon in, in, uh, in, in place to, for implementation because it will support Kenyans and help Kenyans who will run maybe into any disaster and who needs some support. Thank you. Before we continue, I'm very proud to welcome the students from Little Lambs Primary School from my Naipkoi constituency, Wasingishu County. You can, you can thump your feet for them. That's my constituency and the school of my, former school of my nephew, Brian Boss. You're welcome. On behalf of myself and the rest of parliament, I welcome you to these proceedings. Thank you. The Honorable, the Honorable Member for Bondo, Honorable Gideon Ochanda. Uh, but thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as I rise to support the bill, I, I think there are three things that we need to look at very keenly. When we look at disaster, we look at the issue of emergencies and we look at the issue of crisis. Now, I think these three things, uh, we really have to either define them or to place them exactly where they belong and to be prepared for them. Because many times, what we, uh, sometimes even the kind of debate that we are having around here now, but our speaker is indicating a, a disaster as a crisis. But then there are many times that we also must look at disaster as an emergency. And we look at, when you look at disaster as an emergency, the level of preparedness in this country is almost zero. Emergency or disaster does not go with bureaucracy. And what we have, and even some of the proposals that we are talking about, are still creating bureaucratic arrangements. You are still talking about a council, you are still talking about arrangements in terms of how to, to, to get to address issues of, 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 of emergency or issues of disaster, Madam Speaker. Uh, so in my, in my view, uh, we have to really rethink as a nation in terms of how we want to look at disaster. Uh, there, there are situations like when you look at the kind of, of bureaucracy or uh, levels of approvals 
that you need to respond to a disaster, I think sometimes they are very unnecessary. I remember a situation arose here one time where there were people who were stuck in the lake because of hyacinth. And, and getting a response, because we wanted a, 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 a chopper just to airlift some two or three people. Imagine the guys are stuck in waters and we are told you must write to, to, to some disaster committee in Eldorado, or you must write to somebody in charge of the police system for purposes of emergency. For how long do you look at this thing, look at in terms of raising a letter to get to an office, to have a council sit down, to approve that this disaster is actually a disaster that requires a response. So, Madam Speaker, we really have to think of this uh, generally. And when we think of it, we must uh, look at the proper definition of these things. Because sometimes we are trying to place uh, arrangements for emergencies, uh, yet we don't place uh, arrangements for crisis, crisis that even we are forewarned. Like when we are talking about disaster in terms of flooding now, these ones we are forewarned. They can't be a disaster anymore. When you are talking about, about uh, 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 more, uh, uh, drought, we are many times forewarned. There are signals that are sent. So when we are looking at that, we don't need to look at it as a disaster. We need to look at it in terms of how well are we prepared for purposes of signals. Because that is not really a, that's not a disaster in my view. There's a crisis in waiting, and we are forewarned. We are told that, no, this is likely to happen. We are now told that rains are going to be with us here until June, for example. The level of preparedness, why do we want the normal bureaucracy to address a crisis? Because these are some, some of the things that, as we are forewarned, uh, we really now need to put arrangements that can take care of issues of crisis, but not issues of disaster. So, but when you look at a, as a, at a disaster in the direction of an emergency, some of these bureaucracies are unnecessary. We need spot-on uh, reporting system that can respond to when there are emergencies. And I think that's where some of the members, in my view, are either taking disasters to be crises which you need to prepare, or some are taking disaster as emergencies. But if you look at them as emergencies, we are less prepared as a nation. Emergencies don't need bureaucracy. Emergencies need spot-on responses, and this is a structure that must be in place outside the arrangements for crisis. Crisis that we have forewarned, crisis that indicators are clearly there that they are going to take place. So those ones require an arrangement that we don't try to put together in terms of disaster management, Madam Speaker. And then again, issues of disaster sometimes require immediate low-level responses. We are constantly talking about national, that we don't need to have a national council. How do you respond to a disaster in a village through a national council? How do you respond to small little disasters that happen in a school or happen in a setup in the, in the, in the communities? And you want to look at a, a national office, a national agency, a national bureaucracy to respond to them, Madam Speaker. So in my view, immediately we separate the issues of crisis from disaster and from emergencies is when we'll be establishing proper infrastructure for responding to them, Madam Speaker. Thank you. The Honorable Daniel Kirito, member for Igembe Central. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for giving this opportunity to add my voice to this very important bill. Madam Speaker, the National Disaster Management Authority will be very crucial and very important agents in this country. Madam Speaker, the disasters that has, have been falling in this country have caused us a lot of damages and a lot of losses. Madam Speaker, the main uh, essence of uh, this uh, agency is mostly on prevention. The, this country has become a country of age and it will be very embarrassing whereby we are made our pants down by disasters without being prepared. Madam Speaker, for example, the flooding. The country should be prepared and have policies on place and know when the rains will be excess so that you can be in a position even to collect the floods and use that rain in future for, other, uh, for, for useful purposes. Madam Speaker, the country cannot afford to be uh, losing ear in, ear out through these uh, 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 floods. Madam Speaker, we have cases of burning of schools, burning of properties. 
where by most, in most cases you find electricity which have been fortunately placed, we should be in a, prep, in a position to be prepared properly to be able to avoid such unnecessary damages and losses. So if we are able to plan effectively and uh, before these disasters come, we can save a lot of uh, funds which, are ending, uh, end, uh, which end up being destroyed through these uh, disasters. Madam Speaker, we have some other uh, disasters. Even this uh, rustling of cattle should be considered as a disaster in this country. Because you find a community, a family, that has used all their resources to put up a farm and put up animals, then wrestlers come and steal them. That one also should be considered as a disaster, and the organization should also take care of that to know how to compensate those who will be losing their animals. So in, in short, Madam Speaker, I'm supporting this bill, and I think we should be prepared uh, earlier enough so that we can be able to counter these uh, uh, disasters beforehand. And it, it will be very embarrassing for a country like Kenya, which, is, uh, which has gone miles in technology advancement, not to be in a position to de detect disasters in time before they strike. And most of these detector, uh, disasters are what, uh, example, for example, the, the flooding and the burning of uh, some institutions are things that should be early enough detected. Uh, the, 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 the authority from the county level is, will be very vital because in some counties you find they don't have even fire extinguishers, even machines to put off fire are not, are, are not in place. Therefore, this uh, agency uh, will man management uh, will, will be having those uh, equipment in place so that you can fight those disasters in time before uh, more destructions are done. We also need uh, to uh, the uh, post disaster rehabilitations. There are communities that have earned all their properties lost in these disasters. We need a counseling centers where these, those who have been affected can be taken through counseling so that they can continue, continue with their lives after the disasters. Because some end up losing everything, they lose their lives. Others end up even hanging themselves after realizing that they've lost everything. So after the, the post-disaster rehabilitation should be uh, handled properly, whereby you can have uh, counseling centers uh, for the, uh, the affected members of the community. We also have uh, uh, the openness and the management of the resources, which will be managed by authority, by the, by, the, by, by the team, and it will be very important that whatever is given to run this uh, the disaster management, there will be openness and accountability, and that will go very far in making sure that the real targets and areas that have been affected have thoroughly been taken care of and uh, the, the affected are served. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I support. The Honorable Member for Lunga Lunda, Honorable Magale. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for giving this chance uh, to contribute on this very crucial uh, bill. And I want to say on the onset that uh, I support the bill because uh, it is really touching on very crucial matter, which, of course, has been mishandled by the fact that uh, always we were saying that uh, disaster is devolved. Now, when anything happens in the counties and uh, all over the country, then it becomes a blame game. But then more so, what makes me to be very curious about this bill is that there's a special team, which maybe it will be at the national level, but I would wish to suggest that as much as would wish to have the team, uh, whether an authority or whatever name it will be given, but let that team be cascaded down to the counties and even to the wards so that the response can be so quick uh, uh, to ensure that uh, the affected people around the county or in the, uh, wherever they'll be, they'll be getting the response very quickly and uh, be salvaged. But again, I want to uh, uh, say that uh, even the classification of uh, disasters like the wild animals, let me say, uh, in my area where I, I come from. Sometimes the farmers are being affected in one way or the other. 
the jumbos or elephants come into their farms, destroy the, the farm products or the produce, and then in one night, the whole sub-county or the whole uh, village doesn't have uh, or it's affected by the wild animals. Then this should also be classified as uh, also a disaster, but more uh, to, to emphasize on the issue of uh, the commonly known disasters like floods, uh, many other uh, disasters. I wish to say that uh, when it happens, then the coordination should be actually from the grassroots, as I've earlier said, that the committee which should be formed should, should emanate from the village uh, level coming up. So the coordination should be in that the member of parliament, the women rep, the uh, MCS, and any other important leader who is, uh, who is actually affected or in charge of the affected area should be put into consideration because we don't want a situation where a disaster has taken place, then now it becomes uh, phone calls and whoever is being called, he doesn't know where to start and how to do it. Uh, there should be a very important communication uh, 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 strategy, whereas everybody will be brought on board and be responsible. Because as we speak today, it is either the, 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 the count commissioner or the governor who is supposed to take responsibility. But I, I wish to state here that the member of parliament in this case are always being blamed that the roads, the, the bridges, and all that, all these disasters which take place, the member of parliament and the women rep, so to say, are the ones who are affected first. So as we form the authority or whatever organ which will be formed to address this issue, then I would propose that either a representative of the MP and the member of uh, or, uh, the women rep be in those uh, uh, committees. And I wish submit, to submit and to say that I support. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Member John McCarley, Member for Kandui. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to also weigh in on this particular bill. At the outset, Madam Speaker, I will say I actually support the bill wholeheartedly. Schedule 4 of our Constitution actually grants the power to manage and control disasters to our county governments. Equally, Schedule 5 gives national government also powers to control issues related to disasters. So this bill, Madam Speaker, comes in at a very handy stage to provide a legal framework for the management of disasters, risks, and emergencies. Madam Speaker, in the past we have had floods, we have had droughts, we have had, uh, uh, we have had animals dying, we have had many, many risks in our respective constituencies and counties. But ultimately, we have not had a legal framework that provides for the coordination and management of risks and disasters as and when they occur. So, Madam Speaker, this bill, whose object is basically to provide a legal framework for the coordination of disaster and risk management activities in the, both at the national level and at the county level, is appropriate and is welcome at this particular stage. Of critical concern and importance in this particular bill is the creation of an authority that will be able to coordinate all these activities relating to droughts, disasters that happen and occur in our constituencies, counties, and the country at large. This authority that is created will be able to harness information, coordinate all the activities, so that we do not approach the issue of disasters and risks in an uncoordinated manner like we have been doing in the past because there has been no legal framework. So this particular bill comes in to fill a lacuna that has been existing in our laws the absence of a legal framework. We keep on saying, Madam Speaker, information is power. If we look at chapter three of this particular bill, it sets up an electronic management system that has to give information, provide information to apprehend uh, uh, disasters that are supposed to come, to look at past events and be able to apprehend them so that we can be able to be able to control them. So the bill is literally well-intentioned, Madam Speaker. In the recent past, we have had disasters that have come and we have not really managed them very well. 
We have had funds allocated to them, but those funds have not been properly managed. They have become cash cows for some individuals who have taken disasters as an avenue to, 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 to misappropriate funds. This bill has ample provisions that criminalize misappropriation of funds that have been actually been set apart for management of disasters in our respective constituencies, wards, and counties. And of critical importance, Madam Speaker, Article 6 of our Constitution critically says that the county governments and the national governments shall consult and cooperate in the, in, 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 in the, in the delivery of services to, our, to, to, to the citizens. This particular uh, bill sets provisions for coordination between the national government and the county government in the management of disasters. During the Committee of the Whole House, Madam Speaker will be making some proposals to amend several provisions regarding the composition of these county committees and the national committees will be able to deal with uh, issues relating to disaster and risk to include other provisions that will make this act more fulfilling in fulfilling its objects. Madam Speaker, I entirely support this bill and, and urge that we pass it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. The Honorable Edith Nyanze, member for... Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Mad 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 Speaker, for giving me this opportunity to hear my views on this uh, um, bill. Uh, this, it, it seeks to establish a risk management authority, and I actually support it because it also seeks to establish a risk management fund which will provide funds um, for risks and disaster so that uh, we as a country, we are prepared and also have a mitigation response in risk management matters. So it's uh, actually a, a bill which has come at the right time to actually address some of the issues which have affected us as a country and which have caused, has caused a lot of death in, in our country. And uh, with such, um, it also seeks to uh, establish an authority, and with such an authority, we would have a central place where disasters can be reported, where emergencies can be reported, and it's even better because there is a risk management committee in the counties where the governor is the chair, and with such uh, uh, representation up to the counties, then it would be very easy to even report um, disasters because from the, the such committees, then they will be able to establish whether a, a risk is uh, for the county to handle or whether it's a national disaster for the national government to handle. And uh, in, in the past, the coordination has been bl uh, blamed for slow response uh, to crisis. The coordination has been blamed, but now with the establishment of such an authority and with the presence in the county, then uh, the response will be very fast, and this will save lives. So it has come at the, the right time. Um, but Madam Speaker, uh, some of the disasters which occur every time, sh it should reach a time when they, no, they are no longer uh, uh, labeled, should not be labeled as disasters. Because if something comes every time, if there is flooding in a river every time, then we should come up with a, a solution because we already know the problem. A solution of either uh, building a bridge or coming up with a, a, an, um, a solution. Something like drought. Um, this is something which we know if uh, the, uh, some, some areas will be, especially the also areas will be affected. And with this the risk management fund, with the funds, then what can be done is that uh, when there is plenty of harvest, food can be stored, and so that when there is drought, such areas would be actually be uh, provided with food. So with such a fund and with such an authority, then some of the risks 
should, with the time, stop being a disaster. With such a fund, something like fire, then we should have a fund where we can buy fire equipment and also with a preparedness, uh, we will be able to attack uh, immediately and respond immediately so that we save lives. Um, Mad Madam Speaker, the, I know of a, a river, a river NCU, I know it's in Honorable Mulyungi's a, a place. It killed so many people sometimes back. And if we could also come up with such rivers which uh, are in disaster, because for it to kill people, so many people, although it's being uh, constructed, um, if there was this authority, it could have come up with some uh, mitigation issues so that the, 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 the bridge is constructed. But, but it is not, it has, the, the project has been started and it's not over. I have also have an, um, an accident prone area uh, in my constituency where after every few days people are killed, the road has a problem. So if if there are deaths which are caused in this road between Kombo, Kabati, and Katutu, if um, the, 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 this authority we should also look at such things, where, why is this happening every time, and then come up with the mis mitigation uh, measures, and with the fund, it will be able, they will be able to come up with a solution for all these uh, uh, disasters. So with that, Madam Speaker, I support the bill and say that when it becomes an act, then we'll be able to save lives. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Majority Leader. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I rise to support this bill. Honorable Speaker, as uh, was well said by the Honorable Lord Chakapong, when he moved this bill on my behalf and allow me, Honorable Speaker, to take this opportunity to thank him for not just moving this bill on my behalf, but also having led his committee in consideration of this bill. And Honorable Speaker, going through the committee's report, I do agree uh, with a number of their proposals, Honorable Speaker. And it's also important, Honorable Speaker, to know that this is a bill that uh, I did in the last parliament and is among the bills that lapsed which we uh, sought to revive uh, in this 13th parliament. And the need, Honorable Speaker, emanated from the desire to have a proper legal framework uh, that would coordinate disaster risk management in the country, uh, because we lacked that, Honorable Speaker, and, and we still lack. Honorable Speaker, I remember the time I came up with this bill. It was immediately after the Garissa uh, University terrorist attack. And it was sad, Honorable Speaker, that at that time, and uh, I would believe it's still the case today in the absence of having a coordinated way in which we manage our disaster, uh, disasters and uh, management of risks that uh, would uh, contribute to more disasters. At that time, Honorable Speaker, I remember when the terrorists hit Garissa University and so many students were shot, some killed, some injured, and you can imagine the anguish that parents had. Garissa at the time was around uh, summer times, in the summer times in Kenya, Honorable Speaker. But uh, temperatures soaring to highs of close to 40 degrees Celsius. And I had an engagement, Honorable Speaker, with a medical officer who was serving in the region at that time and coordinating that disaster from Garissa. And as sad as it was, Honorable Speaker, those who unfortunately lost their lives upon their bodies being taken to the morgue at the Garissa District Hospital, as it were then, the morgue could not handle the number of bodies that were being taken there. And bodies by that evening had started decomposing. By the time the government was able to mobilize resources from Nairobi to fly to Garissa to even get fingerprints from the bodies that were already decomposing. It was not even possible, and I was told by those who were in the medical profession, when uh, bodies stay uh, under such temperatures, uh, they get disfigured. And therefore, even fingerprints were disfigured. And that's why you realize it took a long time 
for families who are already notified that they have lost their loved young ones at the university, but they could not be able to identify what body belongs to who. And imagine the anguish parents had. Some, I remember, accommodated at Chiromo um, uh, University, Chiromo campus of the University of Nairobi, and there were harrowing stories of parents being subjected to walk from Chiromo all the way to Nyayo Stadium every morning, going to wait for buses at uh, uh, the um, Nyayo Stadium to see if they would be able to identify those who are coming in buses from Garissa, be able to get information as to whether they have lost their loved ones. And eventually, Honorable Speaker, I remember I engaged with one parent who had traveled all the way from West Pokot, sold his three goats to get fare to come to Nairobi. And he exhausted the money that he had sold his three goats through uh, uh, trying to get accommodation in Nairobi and had to walk every day when they were eventually hosted by the University of Nairobi in Chiromo. He had to walk every day for almost a week and a half before he finally identified his deceased child from Garissa University. And that motivated me, Honorable Speaker, to ask myself, what is it that we can do to ensure that if such a disaster ever struck again, there is a coordinated way in which we can handle such a disaster or others, Honorable Speaker? And from members' contributions, you can hear the anguish even ourselves as members of parliament have to go through every now and then. With simple disasters like the blowing off of uh, roofs of our primary schools by strong winds, or floods, when floods uh, ravage our constituencies, uh, be it in Budalangi or somewhere in uh, eastern Kenya, Kenyans are left suffering because there isn't a coordinated way through which government, both at the national level and at the county level, coordinates to handle disasters, Honorable Speaker. And therefore, we sought to have this bill Honorable Speaker, to address some of these challenges, to ensure that we not only provide that legal framework for disaster risk management, but also to enhance the effectiveness and uh, a coordinated disaster preparedness, how we prevent disasters, how we respond, mitigation and recovery from disasters, Honorable Speaker, because it is one thing to wait for disasters to happen, for, uh, Honorable Speaker. We all know that for many years, Budalangi constituency has been ravaged by floods, or when uh, River Nyando, Nyando and uh, River Nzoia uh, break their banks, people will suffer. And you remember the famous lady of uh, Sirikali's idea uh, during the regime of President Mwai Kibaki. And that lady brought to, for, to the fore the suffering of the people of Budalangi from floods. And I remember government at that time moved uh, uh, from those calls uh, to establish dikes and other mitigation measures, but we do not have to wait for Kenyans to cry out. We should be proactive. We should uh, uh, move ahead of time to see how we can not only prevent uh, and mitigate disaster, but also ensure that Kenyans are able to recover quickly post-disasters, Honorable Speaker. And therefore, this bill seeks to address some of those issues uh, and also to reduce uh, disaster risks and vulnerabilities uh, at the national and also at the county levels of government. Honorable Speaker, members are aware that every county government and even the national government has funds that are usually set aside for unforeseen emergencies. And these contingency funds, Honorable Speaker, are never utilized for the right purposes and you find that a disaster hits a county and the county governor of that particular county has no resources. Yet in their budgets, they had budgeted for a contingency fund for such eventualities and emergencies. By the time the disaster hits them, they are, not, they are ill prepared and are always calling on the national government uh, to come to their rescue. And therefore, we want to have a coordinated process so that we know how do we establish that each of our county governments are budgeting and providing funds for disaster mitigation and disaster management. How do we also ensure as members of parliament who are in charge of budget making that the contingency monies that are set aside to deal with disaster management are indeed 
appropriated for that particular purpose, honorable speaker, and also coordinate so that when it is a county level disaster or a disaster that is restricted within a particular county, the county can first utilize their resources before they go out to look for help. Honorable speaker, also you have measures to know through a disaster management authority, uh, honorable speaker, how can we even coordinate the mobilization of resources? Honorable Speaker, look at the COVID pandemic. You had, we had, as a country, we had to set up an ad hoc committee, uh, look for people in the private sector, in the corporate world, a few public officers, to form an ad hoc committee to mobilize resources, to even be able to look for gloves and uh, masks that were required uh, to prevent a loss of life, Honorable Speaker, and further spread of that uh, disaster of COVID-19. Honorable Speaker, all these things have served to remind us as a country that we are always ill-prepared and we are caught flat-footed when disasters strike. And it is high time that we prepare uh, in a way that we'll be able to enhance our own resilience uh, to the impacts of disaster, disasters and other risks. And also issues that touch on climate change, Honorable Speaker. We are now in the discussions of climate change and uh, Honorable Speaker, how we mitigate issues to do with climate change. With the changing climate, Honorable Speaker, floods, uh, hurricanes, Honorable Speaker, will become very common things. Honorable Speaker, if we don't take uh, deliberate measures for reforestation, soil erosion, landslides will be so common, Honorable Speaker, and unless we have a system where there is somebody checking on what we are doing, both at the national level, at the county and local level, Honorable Speaker, to ensure that even as we deal with climate mitigation, climate change mitigation measures, we are also looking at the effects of that, uh, the, the changes in our climate in matters touching on floods, as I said, soil erosion, uh, washing away all the uh, good soils and the nutrients that our crops need, Honorable Speaker, exposing us to uh, other disasters such as hunger and uh, droughts, Honorable Speaker. Uh, landslides in those areas where uh, they are prone to landslides, like in Muranga County and other areas where the, the, in, like uh, El Geo Maracuet, Honorable Speaker, and West Pokot, you remember the disaster that struck us about two or three years ago. And I remember then, Honorable Speaker, when that disaster uh, struck in West Pokot, even the minister who was in charge of the interior, the minister who was in charge of the small disaster unit that uh, uh, is hosted by the Ministry of Interior. I can't remember the name of that small unit because there are small unit within the Ministry of Interior that deals with disasters. The minister in charge then, the Honorable uh, CS, former CS Fred Matiangi, told the country unashamedly, Honorable Speaker, that he could not access the disaster area because of the weather at that time flying a military helicopter. But the then Deputy President, with a small civilian helicopter, was able to access that place, Honorable Speaker. And that also speaks to the disdain and contempt that some of our public officers had with Kenyan people, that you do not relate to the suffering of the people when disasters strike. It took the then Deputy President, uh, who is now serving as our President, flying a private chopper, and even mobilizing private resources from Kenyans to be able to help the people of West Pokot then. And I was praying the member of parliament uh, from that area was here, Honorable Speaker, because you do not know when such other disasters will strike. But we do not want to find ourselves uh, in a situation where our current Minister for Interior will claim that because of weather, when he has choppers that have navigation equipment, he could not access a certain place because there is no proper framework as to how you respond to such disasters. And we want to find ourselves well prepared, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I do agree with the committee's report that indeed, on hindsight, there are certain changes that we can make to this bill, and I agree with them on the deletion of uh, some of the clauses, like clause 5, 6, and 7, uh, that touch on the establishment of an intergovernmental council that will comprise uh, uh, 10 members. And I want to uh, thank the committee uh, and the chair, Honorable Chakapunga, and say I, I do agree with them. And we will support the amendments that they have proposed 
during committee of the whole. Honorable Speaker, with those many remarks, I beg to support, as I also thank the many members who have spoken in support of this bill. Honorable Speaker, finally, because we are at a time and uh, when the establishment of authorities and uh, semi-autonomous uh, uh, sagas in government is a matter that is at the fore of uh, our national conversations today, courtesy of uh, the huge burden that we have bestowed on uh, the exchequer uh, on account of uh, the management and running of uh, state-owned enterprises. I want to state, Honorable Speaker, we must, during the Committee of the Whole, ensure that the National Disaster Management Authority will or should be a very lean authority that is more of a coordinating role, but not one that creates more bureaucracies uh, to, to get money from the exchequer. It should be a very lean body that ensures that most of the money that will be uh, appropriated towards disaster management goes, goes towards the work of uh, uh, mitigation uh, of disasters, management of disasters, and recovery post-disasters, Honorable Speaker, but not into the bureaucracies of uh, running state-owned enterprises or semi-autonomous uh, uh, government agencies. Honorable Speaker, with those many remarks, I beg to support. The majority Leader, this is a very important bill. You are always very educative, and I'm, <laughs> I'm happy the bill is coming from you. But I wanted to pick your mind for purposes of this general debate. Before, before you sit, I know you will have your opportunity to reply. I don't know whether you have the bill. Yes. Just yeah, something to signify to the committee that will be dealing with this thing with your, um, with your approval. L look at um, Clause 33. Or it, the other one can be given to the majority leader so that as we debate, you know, members are informed in terms of uh, uh, the areas we could, uh, you know, tighten. You see, it, it, it says that this authority has first to classify a disaster as either a county uh, disaster or a disaster falling within uh, the remit of national government before any action or intervention can take place. Assume it was something like that terrorist attack, and this classification is not timed. Or even the terrorist attack we had at the, at the embassy of the United States here. Uh, how, how do you see this, you know, working? And at this up clause, you're saying until a disaster is classified by the authority, it shall be deemed to be a county disaster. It's true, Honorable Speaker, that whenever a disaster occurs or threatens, I don't know how it will threaten, <laughs> to occur, the authority shall determine whether the event is a disaster under this act, and if so, immediately assess the magnitude and severity or potential magnitude and severity of the disaster, then classify the disaster as a county disaster or national disaster, and see record the prescribed. Honorable Speaker, I think these are some of the issues, Honorable Speaker, uh, mm. on uh, hindsight I say we, together with the committee, will be looking at possible mm. amendments mm. so that it is clear that the authority is to determine, you know, when a disaster occurs mm. or when it threatens to occur, for instance, when it is raining and uh, trees are falling off the hilly uh, mm. parts of uh, Muranga or uh, Elgeo Marakot or West Pokot, and there is a threat that uh, they, there is likely to be a landslide, then the authority, we cannot wait for the authority to determine whether that disaster will be localized in that area or whether national government should intervene, uh, uh, because it's quite clear that a disaster is likely to occur or one has already occurred. Mm. They should be able to move with speed and be able to determine the magnitude. And I think uh, we'll do some cleanup in this particular section mm. uh, to make it clear. Uh, so that, again, we are not bogged down, as I was saying earlier, by bureaucracies also uh, that we also create in law. Yeah, th thank you very much. And I think um, in that endeavor, the committee should also look at even the definition of disaster is too broad. Anything that causes death, injury, or disease, damages property, infrastructure, or environment, significant disruption of life to a community is a disaster. You may end up in a situation where everything is a disaster waiting for national government you know, intervention. And as we do that, we also look at 
the, the fourth schedule in terms of the kind of disaster the counties can give them so that we delineate them. The Honorable Dr. James Nikal, the MP for Seme. Honorable Mili, what is out of order? Thank you, Chair, for giving me that opportunity. Chair, I just wanted to inform the Chair, based on actually what you've said, that if you look at the definition of disaster, there is also the word localized, so that when the committee is considering that uh, amendment, they also must remove the issue of the word localized. Okay. And they also need to look at it in tandem with the Victim Protection Act that looks at uh, victimization that have to do with the criminalization in nature, including terrorism. The, the Honorable Milio Diambo, do you want to contribute? Yes, the, I could. The, the but, speaker uh, has powers understanding order number one to reverse so that you go before Honorable Dr. Nikal because I've been with you long enough in Parliament, Honorable Milio Diambo, to know when you want to contribute and when you want to wait. Do you no, want chair, to contribute? Chair, I don't mind waiting. It's just that I thought because you are raising it at that time. Okay, so I don't, mind, I don't mind waiting because he's also my senior. So wait and make those presentations. The Honorable Dr. Nikal, proceed. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me opportunity. Mr. Speaker, uh, this is a very important bill, and I rise to support it. To support it. And, Mr. Speaker, the objective of this is to actually get a legal framework for coordination. And, Mr. Speaker, emergency, uh, emergencies on the disasters, or disasters normally have an emergency element. So most disasters will have an emergency element. And if there's an emergency element, there is need for preparedness, and these are things that actually have to be done before. And then you have to get government systems that work through structures. So I support this bill because if you have to have an emergency response, you need to have pre-planned, and you need to work through government structures that sometimes are actually obstructive, then you need a legal framework for coordination. And when you talk of coordination, uh, Mr. Speaker, when you talk of disasters and emergencies, it is not often one department of government that is involved. It will actually involve many. It will involve security. It may involve the, uh, the, uh, the transport system, it will involve the health system, and all these will be various departments that are doing various things, but in a disaster, they have to come together to deliver. So I, I support that this bill uh, tries to address that. It is even more important for us that we are working in a devolved system, where apart from just having departments, you also have two levels of government, and therefore you have to say who is going to manage a disaster. And because of the emergency nature, there is sometimes no time for that decision to be done. Therefore, uh, getting structures is important. And that, Mr. Speaker, is why I actually support this. It gives us those structures. And if you're dealing with risk, then it's not only taking action, but actually looking at prevention. Every disaster, we must find out why it happened, is it likely to happen again, and put in place preventive measures. This bill actually talks of classification of risk, and I think you have raised the issue of Clause 33. But we should look at it more of classifying the risk than waiting to classify the disaster itself. Because by that time it is extremely late. And therefore, it, we are talking of risk management. So we must then classify the risk. If we have a history, and it also talks about information. We have an information, we have a risk. What we talk of Budalangi, we talk of Nyando. When the rains are coming, we know that these areas are likely 
to have that? And therefore, what risk do you put in place? And even what classification? And if you have a classification, Mr. Speaker, then you can use algorithms. You can't wait until it happens. Then now say, okay, this one is there. You say, if this one happens, this one happens, this is what needs to be done. That is how you actually manage emergencies. You don't wait. You have algorithms, and with those algorithms, you also put up uh, uh, SOPs, uh, how you respond, yeah? So that you know with this, this is what you do, and this is what it be done. And then if you have structures, that also will tell you who should do it. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, I support the Intergovernmental Council of Disaster Risk Management. We must really look at the word risk more than just disaster. If we start thinking of what they will act when the disaster has occurred, we're missing the point. So it is the risk, then the risk then is we, between the, 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 the council, the, the, the intergovernmental. But Mr. Speaker, in our devolved system, we have had a problem. We have a body called the Intergovernmental Relations Technical Committee. You are a lawyer. But you know that we also created something called the, the, the Secretariat of the Council of Governors. Those two things, actually one is illegal and the other one isn't working. So even if we form these intergovernmental uh, structures, we must be willing to actually get those structures to work. Otherwise, there will be points of, of, of argument. We then create an authority. And what I like about this authority, when you have, when you have, uh, you have a risk, if you have assessed your risk, then you, it must come in pre-planning, and if you are going to have pre-planning, you must have a budget. The worst thing is when you wait until you have a disaster, and then now you are starting to look for funds. And the leader of majority was saying, sometimes the government is not prepared, and therefore philanthropists take advantage uh, to seek uh, a lot of credit for it. But the philanthropists are good, but the philanthropists should work within a structure that is laid up. In fact, when you have a disaster, you then have to need to control philanthropies because quite often they can actually derail the, 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 the issues we have. In 2007, when we, 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 we had the IDPs, we had to go in and control the, the philanthropies that were coming within the structures that are put in place. If you work here, this is what you do. You come with your food, this is what you do. We come with your medicines, this is where you put it. Otherwise, they seem to take over. So I like the, 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 the council that are put in place. I like the authority, but the authority I like because they're pre-planning and the budgeting so that there's a framework. Even those who are giving you funds, sometimes it is better for them to just give you funds and work through a structure than actually to have one person coming with a load of uh, uh, food, the other come with a load of medicine. Nobody has checked whether these medicines are registered in the country. Nobody knows whether the food is expired. And now people are just running around helter-skelter so that those authorities will do that. Then we have the county disaster uh, risk management committees. Again, uh, if we can have all these structures, but if we don't have uh, so the standard operating procedures which are within these committees and uh, risks that have been identified and set so that you do this and this, these committees will not work. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, I support uh, this bill and we look at it and look at areas where you really need to look at risk rather than wait for disasters to take place and then try to uh, uh, classify them and manage them. You should be prepared. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Martin Aweno, MP from Dewa. Honorable Millie indicated she's not in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> and the speaker, I heard so her very Millie, well. Honorable you'll, Millie, you'll speak after, after Honorable Martin Aweno. I heard her very clearly. And uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, many has been uh, said about this bill, and I just want to add my voice to it. Uh, disaster management is a, it's a process, really. It's a process 
That starts with prevention, which I want to emphasize, that we really need to think of preventing what occurs uh, so that we are not caught unawares. Especially the floods, the fires, some of these things are time bomb and we know. Um, prevention should also, which I didn't see elaborated here, speaker, we should have a very elaborated research system to know what kind of disasters we have in our country and when they strike. For example, in health rooms, you, you may find the seasons and the flus, and that should be uh, well noted so that we prepare, we give uh, flu shots uh, before uh, it becomes epidemic. Also, there's an element of preparedness. When it strikes, then what do we do as a people or as a system we are trying to put in place? Preparedness is one way of uh, solving a problem. If you're not prepared, the way our counties are not, most uh, uh, of the time you find that uh, CDF is called upon. Uh, school has burned down uh, or bridge has broken, but we can re hardly cope with those. But if we have this structure where we have a national or federal government supporting the systems on the ground, then we can easily uh, manage disasters. Mr. Speaker, there's an element of response. When it happens, some, sometimes it needs rapid response. And sometimes, um, what, you, what you just mentioned uh, caught me. When, uh, when, the, when the disaster is classified as county, and it is more than a county, then what do you do? That will uh, cause a delay. And when you delay in response, then uh, you have a, a loss of lives and even more disabilities. So I, I think I do uh, support what Nikal says. We, we rather classify the risks more than classifying the disaster, because there's no time for classification when disaster strikes anyway. The other element which I want to um, add on to this, which should be magnified, is um, when you have responded, there will be loss of lives, unfortunately, and also there will be disabilities. How do you manage aftermath? That is always left out. For example, if uh, properties are stricken, you may have people homeless. Do we have shelters where they can go? Those should be factored in, and the committees should consider about that. So the nature, the extent, and the severity, and occurrences, all these packed together in a research portfolio should inform uh, us as a country so that when is disaster is about to, or is almost, we can know and proactively uh, respond to it. But I think this is a good bill, and um, I thank the uh, authors. I, I don't want to say much because I know uh, uh, Millie is on, almost on half it, and I have exhausted my point. So I, I, I yield my time to, you, to Millie if that exists. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You've also taken over the, the role of the speaker. <laughs> I can assure you the Honorable Mili Grace Odiambo, MP for Suba North, should have the mic to make her contributions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wish to uh, support this bill and thank the committee for bringing it, or the leader of majority. And I also want to indicate uh, at the onset that it's a good thing that now we are having a legislative framework on disaster risk management. Indeed, I'm actually glad that it's clarified because I remember very clearly we had this bill in the last parliament, but I do notice that it had lapsed. Mr. Speaker, because uh, most people have spoken a lot to the issue of disaster risk management, I just wanted to talk about some of the issues that I've seen that are thrown in the bill. One of them which uh, I was actually intervening because I didn't know that I would have the time mm -hmm. is on the issue of definition of disaster, that because they have included the work local, it actually limits because then uh, a disaster can happen that is beyond local. But when you use the word local, it means it, limi it limits uh, how we respond when you, when you actually make disaster a local affair. And we have seen from experience and even from what the majority leader had given, for example, of COVID. Do you classify COVID as a local issue or is it a national issue? Then, uh, Mr. Speaker, one of the other issues that I've actually picked that is uh, of concern for me also is the definition of disaster, disaster risk management. And uh, I'm encouraging the committee, even though I've proposed amendments already, already 
that they should expand it uh, to include um, having in place a permanent structure of disaster risk management at the county and national level, identifying and map mapping disaster prone or vulnerable areas, situations of people mm -hmm. as part of management, because we already know as a country which areas are very prone to um, flooding, for instance, but we always operate like it's a shock when it happens. Mm. And then uh, issuing early warning of imminent disaster. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if you go even to BBC and other areas now, you actually see alerts that are issued all the time. And even if you look at today's nation, uh, uh, I think ma um, media, I don't know if it was nation or what, that I was reading, the US is already giving an alert on a possible terrorist attack in Somalia. Mm. That is actually a preparation for disaster. Why don't we have things like that? And then re relocating populations in case of eminent disasters and using technology to better, better management disaster. Mr. Speaker, one time when we were in Indonesia with a committee of budget, I woke up in the night, I was sleeping, and I actually thought I'd overslept mm. uh, uh, and forgotten to switch, on, uh, switch, on my, uh, switch off my TV. And Mr. Speaker, after a while, I actually discovered that it was an automated system coming through the TV that was warning us that there has just been an earthquake of this magnitude and we should go out and we should do X, Y, Z, you know, for a focal point. And Mr. Speaker, by the time I was walking down, I think God gave me an amazing uh, ability to sleep. I met people walking up. I had slept through the earthquake. And when I reached, I found people that were in centralized places. Should we have an earthquake in Kenya? I can tell you it will be shocking how we'd react. Because we don't have those centralized places. In Indonesia, everybody knows there's an earthquake. Every hotel has a centralized area. We should also have those automated systems even in our hotels, mm. not just for earthquakes, but for other uh, things. I'd want to say, for instance, my own county, Homa Bay, is an earthquake prone area. But we have such things. I know Honorable Gladys will be doing something about it. She's just done her first year. But in terms of the law, those are the things that we need to be putting. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the other issue that is concern, of concern to me is the issue of the def definition, again, of emergency preparedness. And I'm encouraging the committee that what we need to add as part of emergency preparedness is having a policy in place for both the national and the county government, but also having in place a monitoring system for both the county and national government, having in place an early warning system, a continuous public education and awareness of the, uh, of the, uh, to the public on disaster risk response, including emergency numbers and centers, and having in place facilities and equipment for effective and quick response in case of dis disasters, including fire trucks, land, water, and air ambulatory services. Mr. Speaker, right now, if, if we were to have a disaster in Fangano Island, would actually have a challenge because we don't have a, a boat ambulatory system. I know we've raised it with our governor and she said she will bring it, but uh, I'm not just saying it in relation to Oma Bay County. What about other areas that are you know, uh, covered by water? If there's an, an emergency or a disaster, how do you respond quickly? And uh, because now the, the, the systems that we have there are mainly private. And even for us to mobilize them, you might find the ferries in Kisumu or wherever, and they are slow. If you are dealing with disasters, you need quick response. So for me, those are some of the issues that I'd want. Again, in clause four, one of the guiding principles should be protecting vulnerable groups, including women, children, persons with disabilities, and the elderly in cases of disasters. Uh, because we have not mentioned them specifically, but disaster affects different groups differently. When you have women and children, when you have disasters, women will be prone to sexual abuse and all other kind of issues. How do we respond to women in disasters like that, where they do no longer have any habitation or whatever? What about menstrual and gene and things like that when you have disasters? And then I'm also suggesting that we need to have the minister for gender because of that issue in the management authority. I know we are also trying to make it smaller, but even as we make it smaller, we need to have the Minister for Gender, who mercifully a lot of times also doubles up as the one in charge of the young person. But uh, I know that now it's not the same, but it would be important. 
And then, uh, Chair, on the issue of governance, it's an issue that I've been spe speaking to uh, a lot in the, in, on this floor, but I will re-emphasize it. Chair, we have this tendency that you find one Kenyan in two boards, or in having serving a government office, but also in a board. When there are many Kenyans who don't have anything, why don't they also serve in those boards? Or we have one person that have exceptional intellectual capacities. Those are things that we also must address. We must also, in terms of governance, one of the other issues that we must also look at is the way we phrase the powers that we give the chair of the board. And one of the powers that we need to give the board is not to dismiss somebody for absenting themselves, but without justification. Chair, one of the other things that I'd want to say is also that we need to ensure that we take a zebra approach when we are appointing um, the boards or the offices to this, any of the bodies. And so that if you have a male chair, you should have a female a vice and vice versa. Mr. Speaker, I've written a, a, a few of the issues. I'm not going to mention all of them, but I just want to complete by saying one of the things that I've told you before, I'd have sponsored the Victim Protection Act. And one of the clauses in the Victim Protection Act is the issue of victimization, mass victimization arising for a, from a crime. So for instance, the issue of terrorism. And one of the things it does, it says that, and it, this is actually born of the fact that uh, when we have seen all the times that we have seen terrorist attacks, how have we responded as a country? Every single person has walked in there to respond, not the officers. Secondly, in their response, we don't preserve um, the evidence. We don't also look at the victim. We don't see, like what you see, if you actually look at a lot of the programs uh, uh, in the US or other areas, that they will preserve the dress that the person is wearing for purposes of identification or any other identifying features. I was very shocked one time when I went to Kenyatta National Hospital and I saw recently that they wanted to dispose of bodies. And they were telling people to just come and dispose of bodies. And I said, and I asked them, do you keep in such cases of, of disposals? Any evidence that when somebody one time wants to identify a person who is lost, they can do that? And they said, no, they don't have. I was actually shocked. So that is why, for instance, one of the people who used to be an ODM member called Matunga who disappeared from Gwasi, to date can't be traced because there is no DNA evidence. This applies to mass victimization as well. So Mr. Speaker, I've uh, proposed several amendments to this bill. It is a good bill, it is a timely bill. I encourage the majority speaker to be more futuristic and stop looking backwards and always blaming other people, including Honorable Matiangi, because the country has moved on with those few remarks I support. Thank you, Honorable. Milio Diambo, always very informative. The Honorable Dr. Suzanne Kiamba, the MP for McQueen. While I think it is in order to have a disaster uh, management authority, I wish to raise some few concerns. And one of the concerns I wish to raise is the fact that in this country we are working very hard to create very many structures. We've made so many structures that ends up having no budget or money to do what we wish them to do. I want to give an example when we come to issues of water and issues water. You'll find it an Ahadi, you'll find uh, the Tana, you find quite a number of Walma, and you'll find like around three or so structures. But when you look at the budget to deliver what is supposed to be delivered, honorable speaker, we tend to find it quite wanting. So I'm of the opinion, like we have a ministry under which disaster risk management is there, is under that particular ministry. And you realize that the institutional capacity within the ministry is very weak. My, my concern is, why should we continue making more structures while we have institutionalized structures that don't have capacity? The moment we create a structure, honorable speaker, we attract a budget. We are living at times in this country when money is very scarce. 
So when I sit down and listen to this bill, I'm seeing a new budget coming up. And I'm wondering, Honorable Speaker, when we continue creating these many budgets over here, over it, when will you, we have money for the outcomes which we want to deliver in this particular country? I also find it very interesting, Honorable Speaker, when we look at the fact that um, disaster is something that happens once in a while, not every day. But the moment you create an authority, you have to have a budget that has to be taken care of every month. In my view, disaster should be mainstreamed because we have health-related disasters, we have uh, water-related disasters, we have food security-related disasters. In my view, an authority is so much an overhead. We need every department to mainstream the risk management and disaster. And by that way, we reduce the cost of running these disasters right from the national level up to the county level. Otherwise, we'll have so many structures and no money to deliver the kind of uh, outcomes we want to our own people. So, Honorable Speaker, of course you can see I really do not agree with this motion of having more structures. As a Kenyan uh, representative, I'm interested in delivering outcomes to our people. Even look at even our own leadership structure. A Kenyan at the grassroots there is represented by a president, a deputy president, a senator, a woman rev, a governor, a member of parliament, an MCA. I have not mentioned the chief and his assistant. What reaches that voter at the ground under all that particular process? I'm feeling even when we go to service delivery, we are going still to the same, let me not call it mess, to the same kind of thinking where we create so much structure that when it comes to service delivery, we spend most of the income without bringing the change we want. Honorable Speaker, I am opposing this motion because in my view, I think risk management is not something that happens every day and should not have somebody sitting 365 days to wait when disaster comes. But the people in every sector, people in every ministry, we should strengthen the disaster component. And by so doing, we can deliver seamless outcomes to our people when disaster emerges. Otherwise, Honorable Speaker, I stand to oppose that creation of a structure. I wish it could be integrated in already existing structures that we have and we deliver the service. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Mm. Honorable Dr. Suzanne Kiamba is saying when Parliament is struck now, should not have some authority sitting somewhere still deciding whether there should be response? We should build in disaster response within systems so that there is no need for authority. Uh, I hear her to be saying that. And Honorable Martin Oweno, of course, says that we should classify disaster, those ones which the counties need to respond to, those ones the national government, instead of waiting for a disaster to sit down and then plan. Everybody would be dead by then. <laughs> the mover should now reply. Honorable Dr. Undo, I see you, but I, I, I remember I gave you opportunity to address the nation on this particular one. Yes, sir. So, so mover. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Speaker. Uh, I want to, on behalf of the leader of majority, uh, the Honorable Kimani Chungwa, the member for Kikuyu, I want to take uh, this opportunity to reply. Now, Honorable Speaker, uh, first of all, I want to thank all the Honorable Members who got an opportunity to contribute. And uh, I want to, Honorable Speaker, say that uh, we have taken uh, their concerns, we have taken their contributions, and we are going to critically uh, look at them and see how we are going to incorporate uh, what honorable members have raised uh, while debating this uh, bill in the next stage. 
So, Honorable Speaker, I also want to take this opportunity to thank the members of the Regional Development Committee for doing a good job. But, Honorable Speaker, equally, I want to say that, uh, of course, wherever they are, they have also seen the concerns of Honorable Members, having gone through the report, having gone through the bill, and uh, they have also made proposals. Honorable Speaker, uh, I think uh, I have seen members talk about the definition, definitions that we need to recheck. I've also heard that uh, from you, the Honorable Speaker, we have to look at Clause 33 and many other proposals that members have given. As a committee, we also proposed amendments to this bill, which of course we're going to bring in the third, uh, in the next stage of this bill. So, Honorable Speaker, together with what uh, Honorable Members have proposed, we are going to uh, look at it again, and then uh, come back here and we agree as a house on uh, how we are going to move forward. However, uh, Honorable Speaker, you have seen that the majority of members have supported this bill. And uh, from their contributions, this bill would not have come at a better time than now. So I want to sincerely commend them and thank them for their support. And uh, of course, whatever they have again uh, raised as a way of uh, we need to relook at, I think is welcomed. Now, Honorable Speaker, uh, disasters have been managed from various quarters in this country. Like, for example, when we had a landslide in the West Pocot the other time, it struck, it, that was my constituency, Sigor, part of Pocot South, and some other regions of this country. Responding was by the Kenya Defense Forces mainly, and uh, in certain instances, it was even very difficult for agencies and even well-wishers to access the areas that had landslides. So it was really very, very difficult. And uh, I think now, by coming out with this bill, which, uh, Honorable Speaker, now seems to uh, provide a legal framework uh, so that uh, we have coordination of disaster risk management. Because as it is now, it is done through the KDF. There is an, a disaster operations center at the Ministry of Interior. We have uh, agencies like the, 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 the Red Cross and others. So it's important that uh, we, have, uh, we have a framework, a legal framework, so that all these actors involved in disaster risk management and uh, disaster risk management could be, get coordinated and even take stock of even the actors in disaster risk management. So we have even proposed in this bill that uh, we are going to have a register of all the actors and players who are going to uh, uh, do something about disaster. Uh, disaster. Honorable Speaker, uh, the fourth schedule to the Constitution provides that disaster management is a shared function between the two levels of government in this country. That is the national government and the county government. That is why, Honorable Speaker, we have uh, here uh, proposed a national disaster risk management authority and at the county we have a disaster uh, at the county we have a disaster uh, county Disaster Committee that uh, will be headed by somebody who will be competitively recruited. And in that way, I, I think uh, we are going to have a situation where the two levels of government coordinate and work together to address cases of disaster. Uh, Honorable Speaker, you know, uh, the people in the counties are Kenyans. So we don't have people of the national government and people of county government. So whenever a disaster occurs, it affects Kenyans. And uh, if this bill is going to help in terms of reaction time between the time a disaster occurs and the time uh, 
at the time it is being addressed, then I think this is good. Now, Honorable Speaker, uh, I know that uh, the various issues that have been put forward will be taken into, in, into consideration. Now, Honorable Speaker, when this bill will be enacted into law, uh, the enactment of this bill, Honorable Speaker, will lead to efficient and effective management of disasters across the country. Uh, during contribution here, that uh, it may be too bureaucratic between the time a disaster occurs and the time it is being classified. But I want to say that probably that time, the reaction time between that is when a disaster occurs and when uh, it is being addressed, it can be a very short time because we have also classified disasters into a county disaster and maybe a national disaster. Where a disaster affects uh, more than one county, we can call it a national disaster. And when it is affecting one county, then it can be a county disaster. But in instances where even when it is affecting one county and the county is unable to manage it, then again, uh, we call it uh, a national disaster. So, Honorable Speaker, we have also said that uh, the, 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 the president can declare a state of disaster. So, and I think uh, when the president also comes in and when the magnitude of a disaster uh, gets to certain levels, then the president can declare a state of national disaster. So I want to uh, say, Honorable Speaker, with all the inputs by Honorable Members and uh, what we have also proposed as a committee for amendments, uh, I think this bill will go a long way to ensuring that uh, whenever disaster strike or whenever we have instances or uh, cases of disaster, then I think there is a coordinated way of responding to disasters in this country and probably even in a timely manner. So, Honorable Speaker, with those few remarks, I sincerely thank Honorable Members who contributed and I therefore beg to reply. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you very much. Muba. For the convenience of the House, the question on second reading of this bill will be put the next time it will be scheduled for consideration by the House Business Committee. The Honorable, next order. Order number 13, motion, reports of the Auditor General on the National Government Constituencies Development Fund for five constituencies in Bihiga County. Muba. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I beg to move that this House adopts the second report of the Decentralized Funds Accounts Committee on its examination of audited financial statements for the National Government Constituencies Development Fund for five, five constituencies in Vihinga for the financial years 2013-2014, 2014-2015, and 2015-2016, laid on the table of the House on Wednesday, 14th, February 2024. Honorable Speaker, the Decentralized Funds Accounts Committee is a select committee established for sworn to the uh, National Assembly Standing Orders 205B and is responsible for the examination of the reports of Auditor General on the accounts of, among others, the National Government Constituency Development Fund and the National Government Affirmative Action Fund. Honorable Speaker, the National Government uh, uh, Constituency Development Fund has had significant impacts on our communities and on individuals' lives since its establishment in 2003. Uh, honorable members can attest that the fund has helped transform our communities through the development and the maintenance of infrastructure projects, especially in schools and other educational facilities, as well as provision of bursaries to needy students. These uh, CDA-funded projects have stimulated economic activity in the constituencies by providing employment of opportunities during construction and uh, enhancing local infrastructure that supports businesses leading to increased economic growth and prosperity. Improved access to education, on the other hand, 
as translated to communities being more empowered and leading better lives. It is indeed an economic stimulus program which should be cascaded to other development projects. Honorable Speaker, one important aspect of the NGC India projects has been the participatory nature of the projects that it funds. The NGC NDF of often involves community participation in project selection, implementation, and monitoring. This has empowered communities to take charge of their development priorities and foster a sense of ownership over the projects, leading to sustainable development outcomes unlike other development projects. Honorable Speaker, oversight over national revenue and expenditure is amongst the roles of the National Assembly as stipulated under Section 95.4c of the Constitution of Kenya 2010. Further, Article 226 of the Constitution provides that an Act of Parliament shall provide for the designation of an accounting officer in every public entity at the national level who is accountable to the National Assembly for its financial management. In addition, Article 229.8 mandates this House to debate and take appropriate action on audit reports from the Auditor General. Further, Section 68.1 of the Public Finance Management Act 2012 provides in the earlier that an accounting officer of the national government entity, Parliamentary Service Commission, and the judiciary shall be accountable to the National Assembly to ensure that the resources of the respective entity for which he or she is accountable, accounting officer, are used in a way that is lawful and authorized and effective, efficient, economical, and transparent. In addition, Section 12.3 of the National Government Constitu Constituencies Development Fund Act, number 30 of 2015, provides that the fund account manager shall hold an, the authority to incur expenditure of the funds at the constituency. The fund account managers were therefore invited to respond to concerns raised by the committee in their capacity as AIE orders. Honorable Speaker, it is in line with these constitutional and legal provisions that the committee invited the fund account managers, both current and former, as accounting officers of the NCC NDF to respond to audit queries raised by the Auditor General during their tenure. The committee also invited the board of uh, NGC NDF to respond to policy issues which were also subjected to audit queries. Information received formed the basis of, uh, for the various recommendations outlined in this report, which are geared towards effective management of the fund. Honorable Speaker, the committee, while examining the audited accounts for Viinga, Sambatia, Amisi, Muhaya, and the Luanda constituencies in Vihinga County, the committee observed that in the financial year 2013-2014, all the constituencies examined at audit issues raised following the High Court of Kenya ruling on petition number 71 of 2013, which held that Constituency Development Fund 2013, establishing the Constituency Development Fund since its enactment, since an enactment of the Constitution of Kenya 2010 was unconstitutional. The committee further observed that the issue was overtaken by events as it was undressed, uh, undressed through the passing of the NGC NDF Act 2015 and its regulations 2016, which aligned the fund, fund functions to national government functions. The functions were further aligned by the the enactment of the NCCDF Act 2023, recently passed by, the, by this Honorable House. Honorable Speaker, the committee also observed uh, in all the constituencies, the Auditor General had raised issues on under expenditure or non-implementation of, of projects due to late receipt of funds in the constituencies. The committee observed that uh, this was beyond uh, the capacity of the fund account managers and um, recommended that the National Treasury should ensure timely and adequate disbursement of funds to the National Government Constituencies and Development Fund Board for immediate release to the constituencies. Honorable Speaker, the committee also observed that in all the constituencies examined, 
Documents were failed uh, late for verification during the audit period and recommended that the accounting officers should, ens should ensure that uh, fund account managers comply with the provisions of uh, Section 621B and C of the Public Audit Act, number 34 of 2015, which provides that a person shall not, without justification, fail to provide information required under this act, and without justification, fail to provide information within reasonable time that is required under this act. Honorable Speaker, the committee also made some general observations and recommendations on issues which cut across five constituencies in Vihinga County as follows. Firstly, Honorable Speaker, in, this, in the regard to reallocation and use of emergency funds, the committee observed that some of the projects funded using emergency, emergency funds did not meet the threshold of the Section 6.2 and Section 8 of the NGCDF Act 2015. The committee recommended that the NGCDF Constituency Development uh, Fund Board should ensure that the fund account managers comply with the provisions of Section C262 and Section 8 of the National Government Constituency Development Fund Act 2015, which provides that Section 62, once funds are allocated for a particular project, they shall remain allocated for that project and may only be reallocated for any other purpose during the financial year with the approval of the board. And number two, section 8.1, a portion of the fund equivalent to 5% year in after referred to as a emergency reserve shall remain unallocated and shall be available for emergencies that may occur within the constituency. The constituency committee shall determine the allocation of the emergency reserve in accordance with the act and the number three, emergency shall be construed to mean an urgent and foreseen need for expenditure for which it is in the opinion of the committee that it cannot be delayed until the next financial year without arming the public interest of the constituents. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, uh, in respect of uh, pending ongoing projects, the committee observed that the critical cause of pending ongoing projects being common in the constituencies was partial allocation of funds for projects. The committee therefore recommends that the NGCDA board should, with immediate effect, discourage the partial allocation of funds to projects and ensure that uh, projects are completed at most within two financial years. Further, NGCDA committee should ensure proper costing of the projects is done through consultation with the relevant government and departments to ensure realistic cost estimates and uh, the NGC India board should uh, come up with a realistic policy framework of costing projects for each constituency by the end of the first quarter of the financial year, 2023-24, which is informed by the cost of materials, cost of, of transportation, taxes, inflation index, and the topography of each constituency. Thirdly, uh, Honorable Speaker, the committee observed that there was poor coordination between the Office of the Auditor General and the Fund Account Managers, particularly regarding to the timely response to audit queries. The committee further observed that there is need for NGC India Board to inform Fund Account Managers across the country to respond to audit queries, queries promptly. The committee, uh, the, the NGC India Board, uh, the committee recommended the NGC Board issues an administrative circular directing fund account managers to comply with the provisions of the Constitution 2010, the Public Audit Act number 34, 2015, the Public Finance Management Act number 18 of 2012, and Public Procurement and Assets Disposal uh, Act to number 33 of 2015. Three, the board to ensure the fund account managers maintain the original project management files at the CNDF office all the duplicates are maintained at the project committees at, um, at the project sites to ensure that documents are available at the time of audit. Three, the board should ensure constituents committees employ qualified accountants for the constituents offices beginning 23-24 within the 6% administrative allocation to the board. This will strengthen the maintenance of books of accounts and preparation of financial statements. Uh, Fourthly and uh, lastly, Honorable Speaker, on the uh, accuracy of financial statements, 
the committee observed that uh, fund account managers experienced challenges in uh, adopting to international public sector accounting standards, IPSAS, reporting framework in preparation of financial statements. The standards were introduced in 2013-14 financial year in the public sector, and the failure to comply with the standards in subsequent years occasioned qualification of financial statements. The committee also established that public sector accounting standards board reviews the IPSA standards periodically to take into account emerging issues and conform to best accounting practices. Some fund account managers experienced challenges in application of these standards while preparing financial statements as envisaged in the audit queries. The committee recommends that one, Fund account managers comply with the IPSAS framework in preparation of financial statements. Two, the board, in consultation with the Public Accounting Standards Board, conducts continuous capacity building on financial reporting standards for constituency staff. Three, the board, in consultation with the Public Procurement Authority, should conduct continuous capacity building to all uh, fund account uh, managers on procurement laws and regulations within three months of the tabling of this report. Honorable Speaker, as I conclude, allow me to mention that uh, while examining these reports, the committee did not find anything in advance or alarming, and observations and recommendations of the committee show there is nothing to worry about in uh, the implementation of CDA projects. I therefore sincerely congratulate the respective members of parliament in these constituencies for the good work they are doing in the constituencies and thank the fund account managers, both current and former, for their cooperation when called upon to appear to give evidence to the committee on the audited accounts. I also wish to uh, acknowledge the CEO of the board for the technical support they gave um, the committee during the examination and guidance provided to the constituencies on the policy matters which have streamlined the reporting of the accounts to, of the constituencies. Honorable Speaker, I also take this opportunity to appreciate my fellow committee members for their commitment to the work before us and the sitting for long hours to examine the reports before the committee and come up with this report. I also wish to thank the office uh, of the speaker and the clerk for the support given to the committee. May I also extend the committee appreciation to the Office of the Auditor General, the National Treasury and Committee Secretariat for the good work they have put in facilitating committee and providing the technical support which enabled the committee to finalize uh, the report. Honorable Speaker, I beg to move. Thank you. Who is seconding your motion? Um, uh, may I request uh, the Honorable Modoni uh, Kiara to second? Honorable Modoni Kiara should have the mic to second. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I beg to second the motion that this House adopts the second report of the Decentralized Funds Account Committee on its examination of the audited financial statement for the National Government Constituency Development Fund for the five constituencies in Vega County. Honorable Speaker, I do wish to appreciate that the National Government Constituency Development Fund is one of the funds that is felt on the ground, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, the issues that uh, are normally raised when we call or when we go for audit, Honorable Speaker, it's important to know that they cut across all the constituencies. And during the examination of these financial statements, Honorable Speaker, we do realize that in all the constituencies, the issues that we, we, we come across normally are the same. And Honorable Speaker, we have taken time in more, more often than not to scrutinize all the reports that are brought by the account, or fund account managers. But Honorable Speaker, the committee's general observation as I rated by the mover, 
Therefore, is these constituencies in vigor, for instance, on the issue of unimplemented projects, the committee observed that there was delay in implementing the, uh, the delay, massive delay in implementation of the projects, and uh, the reason given is treasury, honorable speaker, because of delay in disbursement of the same projects, of the same monies. Honorable speaker, the committee recommended that the national treasury should ensure timely and adequate disbursement of funds to the national government constituency development fund board for immediate release to the constituencies to avert these massive delays. Honorable speaker, I also wish to reiterate that the committee's observation on poor coordination between the Office of the Auditor General and the fund account managers, particularly regarding the timely response to audit queries and the need for the National Government Constituency Development Board to inform the fund account managers across the county to respond to audited queries promptly. Honorable Speaker, the committee recommends, amongst others, that the National Government Constituency Development Board should ensure constituency committees employ qualified accountants for the constituency office. And Honorable Speaker, uh, we also observed that these uh, account fund managers, sometimes proper induction is not done because, Honorable Speaker, you find they don't know even what to bring during audit. And this makes the committee keeps, the committee keeps calling them again and again. To repeat this, Honorable Speaker, we want to urge the National Government Constituency Fund Board to ensure that they do proper induction to all the fund managers to avert a wastage of public resources calling the committee and wastage of time for the committee members because we normally sit long hours, honorable speaker, so that we can be able to come out with very credible report. Honorable speaker, I wish to join my chairman in saying that in all the constituencies, money has been used prudently. And honorable speaker, it is important for all of us to rout the members of parliament because their work is oversight. And honorable speaker, it is important also to note that the only fund that we can properly account for and see in terms of development is the funds utilized and the funds that come from the national government constituency. So honorable speaker, I'm saying this because the counties are also in place, but whenever we go, the buildings that we see, Honorable Speaker, we can see clearly their national government constituency development fund projects that have been properly uh, utilized and some are in proper use, Honorable Speaker, except for the few issues that we have raised where there is massive delay in disbursement of the National Government Constituency Development Fund. And on that note, Honorable Speaker, as a committee, I wish to urge uh, the NGCDF board, uh, chaired by uh, the honorable members in this house, so that they urge treasury to release these funds well on time, so that we don't have massive delays of projects. Uh, honorable speaker, I wish to second this very important report and say NGCDF is the way to go. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Honorable Members, I now propose the question that this House adopts the report of the Decentralized Funds Accounts Committee on its concentration of the financial statements of the National Government Constituencies Development Fund for five constituencies in Vega County for the financial years 2013-2014 2014-2015, 2015-2016, 2015-2017, 2016-2017, 2017-2018, 2018-2019, 2018-2019, 2018-2019, 2018-2019, 2018-2019, 2018-2019, 2018-2019, 2018-2019,
and 2015-2016, laid on the table of the House on Wednesday, 14 February, 2024. The Honorable Dr. Wilberforce Oundo, MP for Funula. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. And Honorable Speaker, allow me to, call, to, to commend the Committee of Decentralized Funds for the wonderful job they have been doing. And Honorable Speaker, allow me as well to sympathize with them. And uh, I hope they listen so they can receive my sincere sympathy because trying to audit books of account of 2014, 2015, and those kind of dates, Honorable Speaker, is a Hickland task, and they must have with Solomic wisdom to how they unraveled this matter. Honorable Speaker, and it's also interesting and really commendable because naturally the standard practice that after seven years, accounting documents are destroyed or they're declared redundant. How they have managed to review the financial books of account for 2013, and indeed I must commend an architect can always redraw even a destroyed house, and the chair is an architect I know, and having been a PS, probably has learned the art of exhausting the old, the old ghosts. Honorable Speaker, I must also admit that quite a number of fund managers who attended this uh, meeting to discuss the audited accounts, quite many of them had not even joined the board when these funds were being expended. So indeed, they grappled in the, in, the, in the dark, but it's good to see the caliber of what they are. They were able to adequately answer the records, I mean, to answer all the questions based on the records available. Honorable Speaker, Article 9596 bestowed the National Assembly the mandate to oversight government funds. And they, indeed, this is what members of parliament do here in the National Assembly and also in Mashinani in respect of the CDF funds. And I want to reiterate very clearly, for avoidance of doubts, that members of parliament are not members of the CDFC committees at the constituency level. Secondly, Honorable Speaker, with the change in the law, even where members of parliament by any accident used to sit in the oversight committee, that has long been reversed. So essentially, the CDF fund as it is, is a completely independent fund run by its own structures, the members of parliament only oversight. Just like we can oversight any national government project, we can attend the launch of any national government, oversight, national government project when they're being launched be it by the minister, be it by the PS, be it even by the president, or whoever attends. So our attendance in such launches, such handover, is just part of our representation and of our oversight role. Honorable Speaker, when we seek to find out what has been done, we are simply oversighting. We are not involved directly in the management of the funds. When the reports are brought here, Honorable Speaker, we indeed also have just oversight, like everybody else can do anywhere. So I want the members of the press, the Republic, and everybody to desist at any time associating a member of parliament with any misappropriation, any corruption, or an ethical management of any funds at any given time. The AIU holder, as the chair has clearly explained, is the fund accounts manager. That's the AIU holder at the constituency level. At the board level, if it's the CEO. So if there is any issue, indeed the people to answer those questions are the EIE holders who are the fund managers. But fund managers also work within the local context. So it's always important, the Office of Auditor General and all those who are involved in any form of oversight or auditing must put in mind that this is a local environment. 